Good morning and welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 34th meeting of 2018. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone to switch their mobile phones off as they may affect the broadcasting system. Uh, first off, I'd like to ask uh, members if they're content to take item three in private. Great. Great. Okay, the first item on the agenda is for the committee to take evidence on the Climate Change Emissions Reduction Target Scotland Bill. This is the sixth of the committee's evidence sessions with stakeholders. I'm delighted to welcome our first panel of this morning. Um, joining us are Theresa Anderson, Policy and Communications Officer on Climate and Resilience for Action Aid International. Jim Densham, Senior Land Use Policy Officer, Royal Society for the Protection of Birds on behalf of Scottish Environment Link. Gina Hanrahan, Head of Policy for WWF Scotland. Professor Tassine Jaffrey, Director of Climate, uh, Centre for Climate Justice. Alan Munro, a member of Young Friends of the Earth Scotland. Siri Pantsar, Policy Oper Operational Volunteer, 2000, 2050 Climate Group. And Carolyn Rance, the Climate Campaign for Friends of the Earth Scotland. Now, um, before we move on to questions, just to say that um, there will be a lot of questions that you all maybe feel that you have something to say on. What we, in order to manage time, I have asked members maybe just to direct their questions to you, so do not feel that you have to answer every question that comes up, because we will run out of time if we do that. So um, we are going to be quite efficient and targeted this morning. So I am going to open up questioning um, about the Bill um, in relation to the Paris Agreement and the IPCC's recent report. And I guess this is one that you could all maybe answer briefly. Do you think the bill is adequate to comply with A, the Paris Agreement, and the recent IPCC report? If you just maybe raise your hands and indicate to me if you want to answer. Yes, Carolyn Rance. Um, so, of course, the Paris Agreement commits all nations to holding the increase in global temperature rise to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit that to 1.5. And the IPCC report, which came out just a few weeks ago, made very clear the, the pathway that we need to be on to meet those targets. And it talked about the need for urgent, rapid, transformational change. Now, if we look at the targets that we have in the Climate Change Bill as introduced, um, we have particular concern around the pathway to 2030, which hasn't significantly changed from the pathway as set out under the 2009 Act. So obviously the 2009 Act, um, the targets in that were set over nine years ago now. At that time, we were assuming that a global deal would be made in Copenhagen, which would limit temperature rise. That, of course, failed to happen. And when we set that deal, we hadn't yet breached one degree of temperature rise. So it's quite inconceivable, really, to think that a pathway that we set under those circumstances over nine years ago remains consistent with a significant increase in ambition under the Paris Agreement. Um, and of course, the First Minister has spoken very clearly about the need for Scotland to play our full part in delivering the Paris Agreement. But unfortunately, with the targets as brought forward, the bill doesn't deliver on the Paris Agreement. Any other points? Theresa Anderson. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think um, the IPCC um, gave us a lot of new, very clear information that I think we really need to take to heart if we take seriously the mission to, um, to limit warming to 1.5 degrees and to avert runaway climate change. We really need to listen to the science in the IPCC. And what it told us is that actually we are pretty much going to use up the budget, um, the carbon budget for, um, for 1.5 degrees within 12 years unless we take absolutely radical transformation action right now. I mean, there's no avoiding it. The science was very, very clear. Um, and I, and I recognise that the bill was, was written before this report came out, but I think if you are asking this question seriously of yourselves, for the sake of Scotland and the world, you need to really understand what this means and actually know that the, the bill is not strong enough um, in, in a number of ways, partly because the, the tar if, if we're using up, um, if we're talking about a 12-year timeline and having a 2050 target for net zero, that, that sort of 2050 is almost irrelevant, um, but if we're using it up within 12 years, we need a much steeper curve 
of emission reductions in the near term rather than, a, rather than focusing on the long-term target? It's not just enough to set targets, though. The targets have to be... We have to, we have to achieve the targets. I mean, in terms of what's in the bill, do you think that those pathways are clear enough or is it just a case of target setting and, and it will, that will force everything else to happen? I mean, we've had views over the last few weeks on that. I'd be interested to know, you know, we, we don't want to be setting targets that we will fail to reach because we want to be a, we want to be a world leader in this. And if we, if, if, if we fail, the message is they're unachievable. I wonder what your views are on that. Um, I think it is more, because we are talking about something so important as an existential crisis, I think it is more, uh, it's better to set high targets that force us to achieve more um, uh, than, to, um, than to try and have something achievable that actually leads to like planetary breakdown. Um, we need to. We need. It's you know, failure of a of a political goal is um, less of a disaster than failure to meet climate targets. Stuart Stevenson wanted to ask a question. Um, I'll come. I, I just wanted to pick up uh, on uh, a word that both Caroline and Teresa used, which was the word science, uh, and of course the IPCC is a review of the science. And I just wanted to test who should choose the numbers in the targets. Should it be politicians or scientists? Um, I think it's pretty clear that our targets should be based on climate science and on climate justice. So we should be setting our targets on what climate science and climate justice demands is Scotland's fair, equitable contribution to our legal international obligations under the Paris Agreement and underneath the UNFCCC. How we then implement those targets is a political decision, and that's where we take the decisions on what's right for happening in Scotland. Just check. Climate science, I perfectly understand the definition, and climate justice, I look at things that Mary Robinson's foundation do, but that is not a science-based observation, that is a moral observation, which, which I support, by the way. Is that a correct interpretation of what you're saying? So climate justice is uh, about ensuring that we acknowledge our historical responsibility. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's a very important point to take into account whenever we're looking at the targets. So when we look at the Paris Agreement, the Paris Agreement doesn't just set out these temperature goals, um, just right underneath, so Article 2.1 of the Paris Agreement sets out those goals. Article 2.2, just underneath, says that this agreement will be implemented with regards to equity. And so it's a very important consideration, which is actually embedded in the heart of the Paris Agreement. So it's fundamental that we must consider that when we're apportioning that global carbon budget to come up with our targets. Uh, and on the point of equity, we're on one hand looking at our international uh, equity, uh, equity and looking at international justice, but we're also looking at intergenerational justice, intergenerational equity, like we've been discussing if we run out of our carbon budget in the next 12 years, um, or maybe a little bit longer if we manage to expand our uh, ambition. Um, it will be a lot more difficult for those of us uh, dealing with this in 2030 or 2040 if we have no budget to, to balance. So at this point, if we make those changes at this point when we have a little bit of wiggle room, a little bit of space to do a managed transition, uh, this will be a much more um, just much more um, productive change than um, what change and what op options we will have in 2030, 2040 um, if we don't have that budget to deal with. Anne Rahan. I just wanted to go back, if I may, for a moment to your first question, um, which is whether this uh, is adequate to deliver on the Paris Agreement. And I think um, from our perspective, one of the fundamental questions that needs to be answered about the bill is what temperature target is this bill aiming for? And I think there hasn't been enough clarity about that yet from the Scottish Government. I think the IPCC report lays bare the very stark difference in effects between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees. It means uh, if we go for 2 degrees, 60 million more people exposed to severe drought. It means 1.3 billion more people exposed to extreme heat waves. 
it means an ice-free Arctic once every 10 years as opposed to once every 100 years. And it means we lose virtually all our coral reefs. Um, with a 1.5 degree target, we have a chance of saving up to 30%. That's obviously a, a fundamental problem in itself, but it's also an ecosystem on which a billion people depend. Um, so I think from our perspective, the bill certainly needs to be aiming for that 1.5 degree target. Uh, in response to the IPCC report, I think what's quite clear from the IPCC report is that the globe as a whole needs to be aiming for net zero carbon roughly in the 2050 range. Now, this is uh, the target that the bill is aiming for, uh, as, as we've been told, so 90% equals carbon neutrality. Now, that would place Scotland only at the global average effort by 2050, which, from our perspective, uh, doesn't uh, do enough to tackle the equity uh, uh, dimension, but it also doesn't do enough to uh, acknowledge the, um, the huge potential, the economic potential Scotland has. We have vast economic, or sorry, vast renewable resources. Uh, we have vast star carbon storage potential. So there, if we can't do this, I can't see what country conceivably can. Uh, so we would like to see the bill setting iconic uh, long-term targets to eliminate our contribution to climate change entirely by 2050 and uh, stronger uh, early action. Um, just to come in on the feasibility question, I think we could spend quite a bit of time exploring that uh, if, if the committee is interested in that. I think the bill um, has set a 90% target because the CCC has said that was at the limits of feasibility when it produced its advice in 2017. Now, that was based on 2015 advice developed for the fifth carbon budget at UK level. Um, I think because there is a really uh, exciting global conversation happening now about net zero and 1.5, uh, stimulated by the Paris Agreement, there's actually a plethora of new research coming forward that tackles the feasibility question. So, for instance, yesterday we had uh, new evidence coming through from the Energy Transitions Commission, which is led by uh, Adair Turner, the former chair of the CCC, involves lots of oil and gas majors, and it shows that we can uh, make huge progress in the industrial hard-to-treat sectors uh, towards net zero. There's been pathways developed at European level by the European Climate Foundation. There's been new evidence on uh, the potential for negative emissions from the Royal Academy and from uh, a number of other sources, including some Scottish academics. So, the, the guts of the feasibility question later on. So there will be okay, ample perfect. opportunity. I want to take uh, Professor Jaffe. I wanted to say something in response yeah. to the first question. Um, Thank you, convener. Um, I'm just sort of picking up and echoing uh, what my colleagues are saying there and what the IPCC report is saying. And I think the, the headline that, that everyone talks about is that every extra bit of warming matters. And with that context, the implications of going from 1.5 to 2 degrees, the implications that will have on, on the challenges, not in, in our, just in our ecosystems, but for people, society, in terms of human health and, and well-being, um, and how that relates to achieving the UN's sustainable development goals. But more partic in particular is the, the challenge or, or the difference it will make to risk of droughts, um, food shortages, floods, um, and heat-related deaths. And I think it's important to bear in mind um, the implications that has for people living in the global south or in the Arctic regions or in the most challenging and vulnerable parts of the world. And I want to pick up on that point of whether it's climate science and, and, and looking at climate justice as a science. And we very much advocate that it's looking at the impact that small temperature hikes will have on society as a whole and building the ev evidence base um, and what difference it's going to make for people's livelihoods and the implications that will have on how society will re be able to, to build resilience and to, to live sustainable lives going forward. And I think it's important that we get ensure that we, we build on that evidence and get that right and drilling right down into into the, the human aspects um, and the implications of if we if we go if we don't reduce our, our carbon emissions and reach those targets, what implications that will have uh, in that context. And I somehow feel that that's perhaps still a little bit of a gap, a bit of an unknown. How it impacts on individuals. Yes. Yeah. Jim Densham. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wanted to just talk about those, the, the points about um, the impacts on wildlife representing Scottish Environment Link. Um, I, I think we, what we can't afford to do is look at some of the pathways and think we can afford to have an overshoot. That's where we go beyond 1.5 degrees and then come back to it through through um, sequestration and, and carbon removal from the atmosphere. We can't afford to do that because wildlife is seriously affected now. This is not a future threat for our, even for Scottish wildlife. 
This is a threat that is happening right now that, that is affecting many species. So we can't afford to go beyond 1.5. It used to be that we used to say, you know, two degrees is safe warming, but with so much more science now, you know, the, and the IPCC report, 1.5 is really what we need to stick to and not go beyond that. Because even if we come back, it might, from 1.5, or beyond 1.5, it might be fine for humans, or for quite a few humans, but for a lot of wildlife, you know, that's serious, serious impacts. And I think one of the things that we, you know, looking at what we need to have by 2050 in terms of our own emissions reductions, the Climate Change Committee talked about 89 to 97% emissions reductions to return to 1.5. And we need to make sure that we don't go beyond 1.5. So for us in, in, in um, many of the NGOs and the wildlife NGOs, we want to make sure that we have um, net zero by 2050 to avoid that you know, catastrophic prospect for many, uh, many species. Uh, and for people as well, I was reading in the IPCC report yesterday that 20 to 40 percent of people now live in a 1.5 world. Their location is now 1.5. So we're not talking about, you know, you know, one world which is 1.5. We're talking about hot spots and colder spots. I and mean, we're quite fortunate here. We only have one degree of warming, although our North Sea is is warmed by two degrees. So it, it differences all over the place, and we need to make sure that the world is safe for wildlife and for people. Mark Buskell has a small supplementary question on this theme. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting point and something that we haven't really covered in this committee yet, the, the, the difference between 1.5 and 2 and really what the implicit target is in the bill on global temperature and Scotland's contribution to that. IPCC was quite global in looking at the impacts. Has there been any analysis of what this means for Scotland? Um, not to my knowledge of what it means for the difference between 1.5 and 2. Um, we would be species that could be uh, threatened. Uh, would we see yeah. an increasing refugee crisis in Europe, for example? So there are many, there are many species that are already seeing the impacts of, of climate change, um, and there's quite a lot of that in, our, in the evidence that we provided to you. Um, I think one of the one of the stories that I've talked about the, the the North Sea already warming by two degrees, and that's really affected the marine food chain quite a lot. The sand eel story is quite well known, where in 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 the North Sea. You know, the, the food chain starts with the phytoplankton and, and that gets fed on by the zooplankton, the, the copepods, the very small plankton. And, but those are very temperature, um, well, they're very um, vulnerable to temperature changes. And you find that they have moved north and, and in, instead of those uh, cold water plankton, we get in warmer water plankton, which are not nutritious. They're not so nutritious. So then the sand eels that feed on those can't thrive, can't, either not so many of them, which affects our, our seabirds. Um, and and, uh, and I mean, those are really uh, a key species, the sand eels, for, for kitty wakes, for puffins. So we've mm -hmm. seen 60% reductions in our, in our um, kitty wake uh, um, populations in Scotland already, and that's 60% without you know, massive amounts of climate change. Um, and in some areas like Orkney and, and Shetland, 80% reduction. So, you know, these things are, are, are affecting us now and they, are, and they are very likely to see, you know, whole colonies wiped out. Mm -hmm. okay, move on to questions from Finlay Carson. There will be ample opportunity for you to come in to make points you haven't had a chance to make so far. Finlay. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, we're going to look at the scope. The, the proposed climate change bill will, will only amend the part of the uh, uh, 2009 Act that relates to emission reduction targets and associated reporting duties. Uh, and the, the consultation is focused on uh, strategic ambition and not delivery mechanisms. So is it realistic that we should look at increased target setting uh, without actually considering what will be required to meet those targets? <coughs> Professor Jaffe. I think um, the target setting is important, but I also recognise the importance of looking at our infrastructure and what's needed to be able to achieve those targets. Um, uh, and I think, well, we've just finished the Arctic mapping report for the Scottish Government, and within that, we were looking at, particularly around moving away from uh, oil and gas exploration into to decommissioning and the benefits that renewable energy has to play. So it's an opportunity here for the Scottish Government to really step into that into that zone and um, at, you know sh demonstrate global global leadership in that. Within that, there's huge opportunities for, for the economy, for, for 
in terms of jobs and for people to be able to get right behind um, developing um, that infrastructure for renewable energy technology uh, and whether and, and there's ways in which it can be done through, through the jobs market or through looking at technology innovation, um, looking at partnerships and linkages with other organisations that we can really build to, to, to make sure that that is really at the heart and core of what we, we stand for. Um, so I think bringing these things together is, is really critical. I wanted to... Um, one of the things I wanted to add was that, um, obviously, innovation and infrastructure investment, whether, whether it comes from businesses or from the public sector, will follow from, uh, from ambitious targets and predictable policy. Um, so having a clear pathway to the direction uh, or the direction of movement uh, clearly set out. Um, will allow not only the public sector, but also businesses, uh, small and medium enterprises, um, and people in Scotland, whether it is young people trying to decide what they want to study um, and seeing that these are the directions that this society is going through. So it, um, while obviously it is very important to focus on how are we achieving those targets, having, having the targets in the work first place will open up um, this solution-making process to all of all of Scottish society, where there's a lot of creativity, a lot of innovation capacity in, um, out, also outside and out with the um, public sector. Gina Hanrahan. Um, we would see the uh, bill as a huge opportunity to um, both align the targets with the sectoral policy effort that is needed to deliver on those targets. Um, the 2009 Act uh, had, uh, has set a precedent, I suppose, in that it covers uh, quite a lot of sectoral policy areas. And uh, Stop Climate Chaos Scotland, of which several members of us around the table are members of, uh, has been calling for a number of sectoral policies to be um, enshrined in the new bill. So to take action in our uh, building sector um, by setting uh, an energy performance standard of C in the 2025 to 2030 region and that might be something that the committee might like to explore further with um, in the next session with the existing homes alliance. Uh, the phase out of fossil fuel uh, vehicles uh, by 2030 and to set a nitrogen budget for the agriculture sector. Now, we would argue that uh, while these are our policy areas, actually they all fall within the scope of the bill because they are uh, about setting uh, targets for specific emissions targets for those specific sectors. I think there's also a very interesting question about how the bill deals with investment and the budget. Um, so uh, we would like to see the bill tidy up some of the provisions around uh, the budget and particularly section 94 reporting so that we're now reporting on the change in emissions rather than uh, emissions in any given year. Uh, we would like to see the bill uh, uh, kind of uh, focus on uh, achieving a low carbon uh, element to the infrastructure commission because we need to be getting our capital investment right for the future. And we would like to see a, a process uh, that aligns the new budgetary process with the uh, monitoring process for the climate change plan. So I think there are opportunities there in the bill that members should consider. Anderson. Um, I would also um, remind you of the, the lesson drawn from the renewables development that um, renewables have far outperformed what was, what was projected, both in terms of scale, pricing, feasibility. I mean, if people had planned based on what they thought renewables were going to do, they would have far underestimated their potential. And I think that this is a really strong lesson for us to draw. Um, we need to remember that um, political feasibility you know, changes once you change the politics. And, and you can't just always define everything by what is currently considered to be politically feasible. Um, and if ever there was going to be a time when a bill needs to take a leap of faith, this would be the one. Rans. Uh, so I think just drawing on that, that theme of learning lessons from the past, we should remember what happened with the 2009 Act. Um, and in 2009, the 2020 target of 42% emissions reduction by 2020, that was set not because we knew exactly how to meet it, but because that was the right target to set in terms of climate science and Scotland's contribution to tackling climate change. And in fact, even the first RPP that was published in 2011 didn't set an entire pathway to meeting that target. And now, of course, we're, we're well on course for exceeding it. Okay. Finlay, you've finished your line of questioning? Yes. Rudy Grant. Thank you. We've heard earlier about why we, as a country, have, as a developed country, maybe have to take 
then the larger share of this, and I think we all agree that there has to be transformational change. But we also had evidence earlier about how that impacts on different people. For example, in a rural area, you don't have access to public transport. You may live in an old drafty house, very hard to insulate, whereas if you are reasonably well off, you will have your electric car because you can afford that. You will have your photovoltaics, which will charge it. You will have your good insulation. How do we make sure that when we're, I suppose, using carrot and stick to people to get um, and change their behaviour, we're not actually penalising people who don't have the wherewithal to do anything about it? Professor Jeffrey. Thank you for, for that question. I, I think um, what we need to be really mindful of is making sure that we develop a policy at, at the heart of which is ensuring social justice and equality is at the core of that. Because with a changing climate, it's inevitable that it, the poorest are the ones that are going to suffer the most. And those who are already in a position of being able to adapt to the environments will 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 channel the bear out of that that situation um, and it is true that perhaps when we're looking at behavioral change and societal change it's almost as if we're the, the expectations perhaps can be quite unmanageable so i think we need to be um, really um, realistic in in how we achieve that behavioural change in society and making sure that there are support structures and resources in place to support those who are in the most vulnerable situations but, but also need to be part of the conversation going forward. Um, and I'm just picking up on, you know, with, with our temperature changes, it's the Arctic, opening up of the Arctic oceans that are going to have significant implications for people in Scotland, particularly those who live in the rural and remote con communities up in the, the highlands and, I and islands. And that presents itself both as, as an opportunity, but also challenges and risks that I think we need to really bear in mind, because that's really where the, much of the impact is going to lie with the, the geopolitical governance of, of the, the seas, opening up of the Arctic seas. Gina Hanrahan. Um, I think there's a there's an interesting uh, element in the existing act um, where the Committee on Climate Change gives overall advice on targets and, and within that it's required to balance a number of different factors, whether that's the top down science, the economics, but there are there are um, backstops there in, in, in the existing legislation to ensure that the likes of rural and island communities are considered what this means in terms of connectivity and other things, uh, that we don't leave anyone behind in that, this transition and that's very much to the forefront of minds, balancing all those really important factors uh, when we're advising on targets or when the CCC is advising on targets. But we don't have the same uh, criteria to consider when we're thinking about policy effort. And that might be something that we look at for the existing bill. Is there a role for the CCC in giving a stronger policy advice to the Scottish Government that considers these factors in more depth? Yeah. Stuart Stevenson has a supplementary I, question. I just wanted to go back to Caroline Lance. Uh, rants, beg your, beg your pardon, um, and the 2009 Act, which I took through Parliament. Um, if I recall correctly, the UK Climate Change Committee recommended 34% and said 42% was the limits of uh, practicality, and that was the phrase they then used, exactly the same phrase as they're using 90%, or is my recollection wrong? Uh, so I wasn't around at the time of the 2009 Act, but I believe it was also the case that the 42% target was put forward assuming that higher targets would come through from other countries, including from the EU, which didn't happen. And uh, in either case, whether they thought that was at the limits of feasibility at the time, we've clearly shown uh, in the nine years since that target was set um, that, that innovation, that strong targets have driven um, the the technological change, the social change that has led us to the position where we are, which is where we have cut our emissions by almost half. Um, and that has come from setting those strong targets. Okay. We found some questions from Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, uh, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, two quick questions. Um, clearly, we know that uh, the Scottish Government consulted uh, on the bill over the summer of uh, 2017. Uh, and we know the, the, the main themes of the consultation. 
Um, but I'm, I'd be interested to hear the panel's view on whether uh, they would say the results of the consultation are adequately reflected in the bill. Uh, and <clears throat> the second question, um, we know that many of the respondents to the consultation stated that a net zero target uh, should be uh, set in the bill. Uh, so should a net, uh, a net zero target or uh, other matters such as the delivery of the, the target and the establishment of a just transition commission uh, have been consulted on as well? Jim Denson. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, analysis that we, we did on the, the res respondents of the consultation showed that 90, I think it was 99 percent, somebody else may qualify that if that's not right, 99 percent of people did want a net zero target in those who responded to the consultation. So to me, that is pretty, well, you can't get much stronger than that really, unless 100 percent, of course. Um, so, you know, why is that net zero uh, by 2050, not on the face of the bill. It, it clearly, it clearly should be. Anyone else want to answer that? Um, um, I would obviously agree with uh, with um, my colleague here that a net zero um, was called for in the consultation, and clearly is something that the Scottish public is uh, keen to drive forward. It is also a powerful image. Um, it makes it very clear to the public that this is transformational change. 90% uh, leaves that little bit of, of space where everybody can think that that's their space. That's the little bit where they don't maybe have to change as much, whereas uh, net, having that clear net zero target um, changes the public image, shows that all sectors need to really look, be looking at what, uh, what work they're doing, and there is a public drive for it. Claudia Beamish had a supplementary question on that. Well, I'll, I'll take Professor Jaffe first and then I'll bring Claudia in. I think, I think yeah. it's to Picking up on the, yeah. thank you, convener, on the, the Just Transition uh, Commission. Um, being in, the, in, in a university sector, I have to say, I haven't seen much on the Just Transition Commission, what it's about, what it's involved. I know I've been involved subsequently to ask for some advice on what, what that, what some of the things that could be considered within that Just Transition Commission, but I, from, from, from my position, I, I would have to say that I think there's a huge overlap between uh, the targets of achieving a just transition and the targets of um, a climate just, achieving a climate just world. Um, and there's a grey area that, that overlaps the two. And I think it's that shady area that much is, remains unknown about, very challenging and difficult questions, again, to do with possibility of, well, people losing their jobs, um, redeployment, um, you know, sectoral-wise, what implications that has in terms of moving forward, looking at infrastructure and all of those implications there. So I think there's a lot of, I think there's that conversation, I would welcome that conversation to be unpacked in, in much more detail. Angus, Caroline. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, add to the comment about the Just Transition Commission, um, and it, it sort of ties in with the question that uh, Rhoda Grant asked earlier about how do we make sure that the transition uh, to a low carbon economy is fair to everyone in Scotland. And at the heart of the Just Transition is the idea that as we are making this inevitable transition, that we ensure that that doesn't damage workers and communities that are currently dependent on high carbon industries. And so we, um, Friends of the Earth Scotland, are a member of the Just Transition Partnership, and we strongly believe that a Just Transition Commission should be set in legislation, um, and it should be long term. For as long as we are making this transition in Scotland, we need that commission to be advising us, because the challenges will change over time. And it's about ensuring that the right people, the people who are impacted, are around the table and are having a say in how we make that transition and helping us to go in the right direction to choose the right policies. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Just I want okay. to come in, Claudia. You're fine. I'm, Mark Ruskell. Um, just, just to perhaps follow up on, on the back of that, convener, I'm interested in your views about the role of oil and gas in the Scottish Government's plans and, and the target. Um, do you see a future for oil and gas in, in 2050? I mean, we've had evidence for oil and gas UK suggesting that oil and gas is going to be 67% of our, of our energy. Uh, we'll be supplying 67% of our energy demands in 2050. Is that implicit in the Scottish Government's targets or, or not? Anyone else want Gina Hanrahan? Yeah, 
Um, so uh, the, the Act, as it's currently designed, is primarily about uh, production emissions, if you like, rather than consumption emissions. So uh, we count uh, oil and gas sector emissions, particularly as they uh, apply to refining, um, and what gets burnt in, in, in transport and, and other sectors. Um, I think there is a lot of evidence that has emerged over recent years that we can completely decarbonise um, the energy sectors, particularly. Um, uh, so we're talking electricity. We've already made enormous progress in that respect. Transport, that transition is accelerating at, at, at enormous pace. And there's also uh, clarity that we can now push on with electrification, particularly in, in the heat sector. So by 2050, uh, the demand for oil and gas products will be significantly reduced. Um, so I think uh, I, I don't have a, a figure for what uh, that will look like. Uh, obviously, something to test. But uh, the, I, I think there is clearly going to have to be a recognition um, that the sector is, is going to have to have a managed decline and that the Just Transition Commission plays a, an extremely important role in that context. How, how important is carbon capture and storage in the mix? Because that seems to come out as being everything I seem to read say that this is an absolutely essential part of the solution here. Yet we had a situation where at UK government level funding for those projects was taken away. Theresa Anderson. Well, I think it's, um, I, I do remember the point when the UK government decided to, um, instead of investing in actual emission reductions, decided to put their climate budget towards investing in CCS. And that was, I think, something like nine years ago. Um, and since then, we've had very little to show for it in terms of all those, I think it's nearly, a, I don't know, hundreds of millions or billions invested in CCS and nothing to show for it. And it breaks my heart to think of all the all the emissions reductions and actual climate action that could have happened in that time instead of choosing that pathway back then. And I think that it's they, they've made the right choice now to sort of dial back a bit from that CCS investment, but still we keep hearing all the time about this, this imaginary, magical future technology that, that really I think everybody doubts is going to be able to deliver anything like on the scale that... Um, that some parties promise. The funding was taken away from it at a crucial point. I mean, Stuart Stevenson will, will, will know very well, which was in his constituency, that they were very near to, to, to winning that, that, that uh, bid to be there. It's not only the technology that has the limits, it's the scale that, I mean, even if they overcome those technical barriers, the, the, the scale of storage potential is actually still very limited. And, um, and the, and, uh, and then there's, the, there's also a lot of proponents which believe that BEX, you know, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage would be able to um, increase the, the potential, but that has massive socioeconomic um, costs because it would lead to, you know, conflict over land use. Um, uh, Gina Hanrahan, then I'll bring in Stuart Stevenson. I, I think uh, in the conversation, particularly around Peterhead, um, that took place, uh, the, the focus was very much on a power sector model for uh, CCS. Now, the power sector has massively evolved in recent years, and I think we, we now know that we don't need CCS particularly to decarbonise the power sector. I think where there may be a role for CCS in future is in the hard to treat sectors, particularly in the industrial sector. And that's very much where the debate is, is rightly focused at this stage. Um, I think there are big questions about what the role of bioenergy plus CCS is in future. Um, uh, what we need to be absolutely clear about is that we are not going to use a conversation about the development of BEX to delay doing what we know how to do now. So that was that was the plea I would make to the committee. We need Jim Benson wanted to come in. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, the the IPCC's 1.5 report recently released talks about BEX and CCS being uncertain and entails clear risks. So yeah, we we it's not developed enough, which is you know perhaps a failure of investment and understanding. Um, what we would be really concerned about is is looking at some of the models which talk about BEX at such a massive global scale because it has clear land use change impacts and and then knock on biodiversity impacts and that's the same for in Scotland too so if we're going to put you know a lot of our land across for bioenergy crops to then burn and then capture that carbon and put it underground we have to think about the impacts of that on on wildlife on on society on on livelihoods um, so it really shows that you know if we want to if, if we want to not have an impact which is bad on our wildlife and on our, on our rural communities, we need to do all the things that we can do now rather than relying on a future technology. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I 
just wanted to ask uh, Teresa where she got the statement uh, that we had limited uh, carbon storage capacity, because my understanding is uh, our, the, all the carbonic acid we could possibly produce from everything in Scotland, we've hundreds of years of storage in the North Sea. But it may be that, of course, what I'm hearing is a more global statement, in, in which case I just wanted to be clear what was meant. Uh, you're correct. My, my, I'm looking at the global. I mean, the global picture. We, the planet doesn't. Thank you, Kimberly. Right, and then questions from Mark Ruskell. Yeah. yeah um, so, if we can come back to the issue of a net zero carbon target or a net zero greenhouse gas emissions target, um, when should it be set? Should it be on the face of the bill? Do we have clarity about the pathways to get there? And does that matter? Um, can perhaps get views from each of the panel, if that's okay, convener, about when you think a net zero greenhouse gas emissions target, uh, the date for that, when it should be set. Okay, well, we go around from, from my left to, to right. Karen on the bounce. Um, first of all, if we can just uh, perhaps clarify what we mean by net zero emissions. Sometimes we've heard people referring to net zero carbon, sometimes net zero carbon dioxide, and sometimes net zero greenhouse gas emissions. So I think it's important to clarify that um, that the bill actually sets out quite clearly what is meant by net zero uh, in the Scottish context, and that's a 100% emissions reduction in all greenhouse gases. Um, so there's, there's sometimes been a bit of unhelpful confusion um, when we use uh, the term carbon. So uh, for Friends of the Earth Scotland, we have um, taken a very heavy equity steer to the targets that we're looking at um, for this bill, and we've used a methodology which is fair shares methodology, which uh, has been drawn up by the Stockholm Environment Institute. And fair shares looks at uh, the premise that we have a finite amount of greenhouse gases that we can burn to stay well below two degrees or 1.5 degrees. Um, and so that's the carbon budget. And then to apportion the carbon budget, uh, fair shares looks at two things. It looks at our uh, historical responsibility, so our cumulative contribution to climate change over the years, and it looks at uh, the capability of different countries in terms of finance and technology. And so the fair shares methodology comes up with a net zero emissions target for Scotland um, in the range of 2036 to 2041. So we, as Friends of the Earth Scotland, support a net zero target by 2040. Um, and I would just perhaps add to that that, that we actually believe that the, the most important target in this bill is the 2030 target, and uh, using fair shares, that would come up it's at least 77% for 2030. Okay, so Pansa? Um, uh, the 2050 Climate Group, we're a membership organisation, and we haven't set, had a specific uh, target figure for our consultation with our members. We have, uh, we consulted uh, over 75 young people uh, when we were uh, looking into our um, consultation response, and we had support for both uh, net zero by 2050 and net zero by 2040 targets. Um, uh, but I think for us, the crucial part is that it needs to be on the face of the bill. We need it to exist uh, in the bill so that that signal uh, of transformational change uh, comes loud and clear from the bill. Um, similarly, um, to refer to the way Paris Agreement works, we think that it's very important that in the bill there are very, which which there are very clear mechanisms for upping that ambition as as we see more pathways. So we believe that it should be um, included in the bill um, with uh, options for it being brought forward as as we see more pathways become clear. Yeah. Alan Rule. Right. Um, so I'm here representing uh, a membership organisation as well. We've not had specific conversations around the, the actual target we'd like to, uh, the, the actual date we'd like to reach net zero, but we obviously we support a net zero target as soon as possible based on Scotland's fair share of global emissions reductions. So we support Friends of the Earth Scotland's and the fair shares analysis that calls for the 2040, net zero by 2040 target um, to, to deliver that. But for us, we also, as young people, you know, we see 20, the, the 2030 target for us is really the most important. As it stands right now, the 2030 target really doesn't deliver much more ambition than the current legislation does. And we see that as a failure for the government to sort of acknowledge the, the, the actual crisis that we're in. 
And, and in doing so, you, you're effectively passing the burden for the more radical transformative, transformative action onto young people. It, it, you know, it's us that will have to address it in the future if you don't address it now. So we're quite disappointed to see the, the, the emission reduction targets as a sort of linear gradualist approach rather than something that's more of, you know, does, uh, where there's more steeper emission cuts immediately right now and, and gradually addressing the, uh, the net zero uh, later on. Professor Jaffrey. Um, well, I'm kind of like basing my, my rationale on, on some more objectivity than anything else. And I think the thing about realism comes into, into play here as well. Um, but I also think that there's a huge opportunity for Scottish Government to be very ambitious and look at a net zero uh, target by, by, by 2040, because I think we've got the knowledge, the skills, the technology, the know-how of how to get there and to, to set a target that, that's realistic based on what we can do and, and, and achieve and deliver with a robust plan that underpins that. Um, and that plan, I think, needs to have at its core community engagement um, issues to do with the economy and governance and, and society to frame it. So I think we need to be very ambitious and bold, be realistic, but also have a very clear plan, a, a, a step plan, really, on, on how we achieve, achieve that target. Gina Hanran. Um, WWF uh, supports a net zero target by 2050 at the latest on the face of the bill because we think to legislate for it is an important signalling effect to communities, to citizens um, and to businesses that we need to innovate and change cultural practices, economic practices, etc. I'm going to be honest, our position is already a compromise and it's a compromise because it is, is balancing the scientific argument, uh, where I think it's quite clear that we need to hit net zero as soon as we, as soon as possible, as quickly as possible. Um, but what we also knew at the time about the feasibility evidence, uh, which showed that there was no clear pathway uh, before 2050. Now, as I said, a lot of new evidence has since come forward, but I would emphasize to the committee the at the latest element of that. Um, and we have since produced uh, work, uh, which will actually be published tomorrow with Vivid Economics at, at UK level. Um, which uh, looked at the earliest feasible date for uh, a net zero target. Um, and it's taking a primarily technologically focused uh, view of that. And it shows that the UK as a whole can uh, hit net zero by 2045 in certain scenarios. Um, so I think there's clear uh, possibility for Scotland to go further than that. And we will be commissioning Scotland specific analysis as well. Okay. Jim Densham. Um, yes, so Scottish Environment Link would like to see net zero greenhouse gas emissions you know, um, by 2050 at the latest, as others have said. I think um, one of the interesting things is from the Scottish Government's programme for government, they talked about we will achieve uh, net zero CO2 by that time. So then the question is, well, what about the non-CO2 emissions? That seems to be the bit that they, they don't know how to get to. Um, so that mainly those come from farming and land use. So what is the pathway for that? So to come on to the, the point about pathways, at RSPB, we've produced this report this week called um, Balancing Act. Um, so that's really saying, how do you address those emissions which come from farming and land use, which are non-CO2? So, and as the title says, it's a balancing act. It's about reducing the emissions through efficiency savings as far as possible, as you heard a lot of last week in your session with the, the, the on, the, on agriculture, um, but also to really boost the, the massive potential that we have in Scotland for sequestration from peatland restoration, from tree planting, from blue carbon, from many different areas, from, from habitats as well. So if we do that, and any anyway, of the science papers quoted in here, which says that we have massive potential to do that in Scotland, and so we can do that. Now, it's very hard, it can be hard to do, it can be hard to see the pathways ahead, but as the IPCC report says, um, we need rapid and far-reaching transition, and that it's unprecedented in scale, but not speed. So that really struck me when I was reading that, because, OK, we've got to do this in a massive scale across the globe and, and across Scotland, but it's, not unpre it's, not, it's unprecedented in, in scale, but not in speed. So we have done things very fast before. We can make this change quickly. Um, and if we get on with it and do things now, as the, the CCC... Um, land use report that came out this week said um, we do need to start now we can we can do that and Theresa Anderson 
Thank you very much. ActionAid also uses the same methodology that Friends of the Earth use, which is the Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, and I really strongly encourage those of you to have the chance to look at the equity reference calculator online um, to, to see what different countries' fair shares would be, you know, taking into account per capita historical emissions. Um, because it's a really interesting tool. You know, they've taken the global carbon budget and figured out what each country's fair share should be. Um, and so on that basis, we would um, agree with the analysis that 77% reductions by 2030 and, um, and net zero by 2040 would be in line with the fair shares approach. Um, and looking at all greenhouse gases as well, including non-CO2. Um, and, and just bearing in mind the point about the steeper curve is absolutely critical. The 2030 target is, is the really key thing here because if you look at the, um, the IPCC report, the graphs themselves, they're very clear that, you know, especially the um, scenario one, which I think that uh, if you look at the options of the different scenarios, the first scenario is really the, the socially um, hopeful one that we all want to, to reach for. That curve is much steeper. Um, and doesn't rely on future technologies that haven't been invented yet to, to, to solve the problem. Um, and so if we want to keep in line with the IPCC, then that steeper curve is much critical. So the 2030 target is really what the focus should be on, and then 2040 is the net zero point. Okay. Angus MacDonald wants to come in with a short supplementary question. Yes, yeah, thanks, Camille. Just, just picking up on, on Jim uh, Densham's point and the, the uh, link um, submission, I, I was interested to see in that submission a call for um, a call to establish a duty for a sunset clause for peat extraction in Scotland. It was just when you mentioned a uh, peatland restoration. I was wondering if, you, f for the record, if you could expand on on that suggestion. Um, we have really good targets within the climate change plan for peatland restoration, but this is about protection. Um, so, a sunset clause would really um, look at areas of land which are are consented for extraction of peat, a thing that we feel is, uh, is, is totally damaging. It releases lots of carbon and it helps people to, to grow plants, obviously, but there are many alternatives. So there are lots of consents out there that, that companies sit on for many, many years. And so many of them, a vast proportion of them, have, have not been turned into actual permissions to actually then extract. So they're consents to do that at some point in the future. We want to see this sunset clause say, um, give a date to say, by this time, you need to have stated that you are going to remove this or not and do away with it. Because we believe that there are many consents out there that will never be removed at all, uh, that, that the extraction will never happen. So if we're very clear about how much is actually going to be removed in the future, we could think about how to recompense companies to do that, um, to, to, to not do that. Um, and we would be much more certain about how much extraction there would be. And if we then use that as a way of educating people that this is a very damaging situation and that we shouldn't be using peat um, for our horticulture, it would actually reduce people's, you know, um, you know, want to buy that product and hopefully reduce extraction in the future. So it's a very sort of practical suggestion. OK, thank you. Very conscious of time, so if we can keep our, our questions and answers short, we'll move on to questions from Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you. Convener, and uh, just for the record for the official report, um, I did actually have an amendment to that effect in the planning bill, which I understand the Minister is prepared to work on um, to um, make it better for stage three, hopefully. Um, could I briefly go back to the planning bill? Yeah. I hope I said planning. I'm obsessed with climate. Sorry. <laughs> um, could I go back to Jim Densham? And I was very interested to see uh, if you could briefly explain to us about the open letter from the uh, groups of farmers um, in relation to um, setting uh, targets. Well, it wasn't only farmers, it was Environment Link, I think, as well, with, with a really significant broad group of signatories. And that's going to lead me in so others can think about my main question um, to anyone who hasn't yet spoken about the interim uh, targets and their significance and importance. So, Jim, if you could yeah, just so, say briefly about that. Yeah, but briefly. The agriculture and farming and land use, in fact, has been seen as a quite a hard to do area of, you know, to, to reduce emissions. Government has only had in the climate change plan a 9% a, a um, reduction envelope for agriculture, and, and we believe that that's not, not sufficient enough to move that sector, sector forward and, and to be fair. So we, we drew together people who wanted, were keen to, 
to say we need to do more, we need government to provide leadership, and these are some measures that we, we want to see. And so we had 50 uh, signatories to that, to that letter um, calling for carbon neutral farming. When, when we say carbon neutral, in that case, that was so that people understood it, but it's really greenhouse gas uh, neutral farming. Um, so you have 50 organisations, NGOs, farming organisations, farmers themselves, academics, um, other rural groups who are interested in signing that. And, and I think to get away from the actual, um, it got a bit mixed up with perhaps, you know, what the actual target is we're aiming for, we're aiming for net zero, etc. The most important thing we felt was that there was a significant, all those people were keen on the measures that we, that we talked about in that. I think that's in your evidence. Um, things like, you know, soil, um, soil, better soil management, um, agroforestry, um, emi uh, um, reducing emissions intensity and, and helping farmers to become more efficient, those sorts of things, um, a much better uh, provision of advice. So um, have a look at that, and that's in the um, evidence uh, that we've provided from Scottish Environment Link to be absolutely clear what that calls for, but there are some four particular measures that those organisations were keen to see delivered. In terms of the, uh, just to start with yourself, and and if we could have um, brief answers so we can get through all the all the other questions. But uh, in terms of the interim targets, how how does that relate to um, what the IPP, IPCC has said about um, the need for um, urgent, rapid transformational change? Um, in in from your perspective, and then from others who would like to comment. Yeah, I think um, you know there's lots of evidence out there saying that we need an, an advice saying that we need rapid transformational change, and we we want to see a 2030 target that is you know 77 percent reduction, and, and we need that you know because otherwise if we if we have a current trajectory before we then act, you know we're we're allowing the status quo to continue and to wait for things to happen by somebody else. We need to start today and tomorrow, doing the things, putting in place the things that we need to see at the moment the the things that you've proposed without going to any more detail just to yeah absolutely know what's I, I, fine or maybe again to to refer to the balancing act report yeah. we we propose uh our rspb proposes in that um you know 10 suggestions for things to do for the long term 10 sorry but for the yeah. interim targets just in terms of clarity okay so are so, there things that can be done yeah now? absolutely so in in that um for the short term to improve there's 10 recommendations for improving the climate change plan which would take you or help you to make sure that you achieve the nine percent but go further and then 10 other suggestions real serious ideas that would take you much further than the nine percent so that gives you a much you know faster trajectory towards achieving an agriculture helping to achieve that 77 percent uh, emission Are reduction there others by 2030. That Want to come in Gina Hanrahan wants to come in. Right. So just to explain uh, how we've landed on the 77% uh, by 2030 um, uh, ask, um, that there's a needs-based case for that and a feasibility case for that. So from a needs-based perspective, uh, we've based that analysis on the carbon law principle developed by Johan Rockström at Stockholm Institute, and that uh, relies on having emissions every decade. That's what science tells us that we need to do. Um, but there's also, I think, a feasibility case around 77%. We, 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 sh we definitely can uh, get significantly further than the 66% that's already legislated for. The government themselves have shown that 71% is a linear trajectory uh, through to net zero by 2050. Um, and we've done some analysis of published scenarios for the climate change plan. So either committee on climate change scenarios or the government's own scenarios and looked at ambitious but credible envelopes within them for specific sectors. Um, and we've, we've found that uh, you can easily get to a 73% target by 2032. If you take a credible, realistic action in a stretch scenario, you can even get up to 79%. That's if you don't use the, land, uh, the windfall in the land use sector that the Scottish Government used to uh, backtrack an ambition in the final climate change plan. I think it's really important to uh, recognise that the CCC in its recent progress report emphasised that, that we need to be building in contingency now for more stretching targets in the future. And our analysis shows that we can do that and there's credible policies to be able to do that. Thanks, sir. Um, I believe my colleagues have uh, responded to the feasibility question more than I could have uh, because I'm not a technology expert. But what I can say is um, obviously um, having 
credible uh, early targets uh, will allow Scotland to continue on its leadership path and will allow first mover advantage, uh, will uh, build cases for business opportunity and technology development in Scotland um, that will be the technology of the future. In addition to that, um, I just wanted to also highlight that um, towards the end of uh, sort of 2040, 2050, we will be dealing with adaptation as well as mitigation. So the more steps we can do now while we, while we mostly have um, the world as we know it, as it were, um, with that, the less we will have to be pushing for radical change at a time when the world is drastically changing around us as well. Alan Munro. Hi. Um, I guess I just want to take this opportunity to, on the question of the 2030 target to kind of re-emphasize the, the moral urgency that I'm kind of here to project. Um, the, the, you know, the ambition of the action that we take now is, is more important than ever because, as has been alluded to earlier, like our share of the carbon budget is rapidly um, being used up. You know, some, some reports say we have 12, up to 12 years left before our fair share contribution to global emission reductions is, is, has been used up. Um, so we need to be delivering the emission reductions consistent with what is demanded by climate science and, and by climate justice. And I want to you know, re-emphasize the point that young people around the world are already experiencing the impacts of climate change. Of time, so re-emphasis of points that have Sorry. already been made, probably eating into other questions. I, I apologize. Can I bring in Carolyn Rance, please? Sure. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, reference the climate change plan as we're looking ahead at what can be done to 2030. Now, obviously, this committee spent a great deal of time uh, scrutinising the climate change plan and making very thorough recommendations for what could be done to improve it. However, when we saw the final plan earlier this year, um, it, it added up so that actually the policies in the draft climate change plan delivered one million tonnes uh, savings that weren't there in the final climate change plan. So we did see a rollback in ambition in the final plan as compared to the draft. And so there are a suite of policies that the Scottish Government has already considered, has already costed, and that the CCC has already put forward and that this committee has scrutinised that, that give us significant possibility to go further towards 2030. I'm going to move on to questions from John Scott. Um, thank you. And I just want to go back to interim targets briefly and ask what the practical implications are of the interim targets that you've proposed uh, for 2030. For example, I know the Scotch Whisky Association say that um, to go for a revised target by 2020 is um, not easily achievable, is unrealistic, I think is the words they have used. But um, accepting what they say perhaps as being a fair comment, uh, would you like to talk about the 2030 targets? What are the implications? Would anyone like to come in on that? And declaring the interest as a farmer as well. <laughs> Teresa Anderson. Um, well, and, and to come back uh, to the original question, does this um, bill uh, match with the IPCC um, report? I think the, the key takeaway from IPCC was urgency. If there was one word, it would be urgency. And so uh, interim targets are clearly you know, necessary in order to meet that urgency question, um, and 2050 targets wouldn't wouldn't respond to that sufficiently. But um, but in terms of what the implications would be, and perhaps speaking to you as a farmer and as has been touched on before, certainly the the land sector and agriculture has has a role to play. We know that you know agriculture do make does make up a significant am amount of emissions, particularly non CO2 emissions, and there are savings to be made that can, as has been alluded to you know, really enhance food security and adaptation as well, particularly through soil management. But as the CCC report that came out last week identified, there are, there is, um, there is uh, a lot of potential if we consider the role of diets, um, as diets as part of the land management um, factor. And, and we saw many reports coming out in the last month uh, m last months that, that are confirming this analysis and I think this is going to be a big part of um, strategies going forward looking at the role of diets and, and how we use land management in that context and, and I think a lot of gains could be made in the short term by considering this. Jeffrey. Briefly on, on the practical implications um, on the target for, for 2030 and I think the question that underpins that is what's going to be the driving force um, to, to achieve that, to make it practical and, and realistic. But I think what we need to do is get the private sector um, mobilised very quickly to, to drive um, uh, emissions reductions in, in that target. Private sector um, 
conversations are, are really critical, um, but also multi-stakeholder conversations um, we need to happen very, very rapidly, very quickly to get buy-in to be able to reach a target if we're looking at the practicality. Well, last week we discussed the implications of driving this by legislation or by incentivisation. Mm. And what would your preferred options be in terms of particularly of land use, which is one of the things I know a bit about, yeah. and the, the new agriculture bill that's coming through post-CAP? Professor mm -hmm. Jaffrey. I, I think le legislation um, as a whole can sometimes be seen as a top-down driven particularly in the land use sector and in the farming sector, you know, people coming, working in that sector that come from all different, um, you know, socioeconomic strata. Um, but I think it, it, if it's legislation alone, my recommendation would be to see if we can get good buy-in to that legislation to, to support the rollout of that going forward. Okay, Sarah Panza. Um, uh, one point on, uh, quickly on this, um, I think, uh, obviously, like you said, uh, legislation isn't uh, necessarily something that we will go and, or yourselves will go and give to uh, the agriculture sector. I think it is crucial to build in engagement, uh, build in engagement with the sectors, build in engagement with young people and all groups within those sectors to uh, to make sure that the. Um, answers to these questions that uh, people who work with the land have um, have uh, that we might not have uh, as as people who aren't in that context um, I think uh, consultation is really key in all of this and it really key in building the urgency I also wanted to just pick up on the um, wording you said easily achieved none of this is going to be easily achieved um, but it will be difficult whether it is now or whether it is in the future there will be some difficult change, uh, choices to be made but they will be easier to make at this point than they will be at later stages but uh, we, where none of us think that this is going to be easy, but it's going to, but it's necessary. Jim Densham. So I think, as you heard last week, the voluntary approach for farming, anyway, has not produced significant uh, emissions reduction so far. So I think we need to build on that. We certainly need to broaden, as you heard last week again, farming for better climate. We certainly need more advice to farmers um, to help them to understand. But we need everything, I think, to be. Uh, we need a certain basic level of, of regulation in order to, to bring certain farmers up to a, uh, to, to a level that is the basic minimum. So we talked before in, in, about um, uh, compulsory soil testing to make sure that that sort of basic planning for your fertiliser use is, is there and in place, that all farms are doing that. And then I think last week we also, and I agree, is that we need to have a certain amount of where we have a new... Um, cap system or post-Brexit system of farm payments, that there will be conditional payments. So it's not all about regulation. It's about different layers, some basic regulation, some conditional things to do with payments, supportive payments, a lot of uh, rewarding farmers for sequestration in the future so that if they do need to you know, change their land use because they have the opportunity to do that, they are compensated for it in terms of payments for gone and all that sort of thing. John Scott. Thank you so much. Um, and can I finally ask you, should the ability to modify targets in both directions be included in the bill? We can have short answers to this. We have a lot of questions still to ask. Uh, Carolyn Rance, did you want to come um, so this is something that we discussed at length with the bill team uh, who convened a technical discussion group on the technical elements of the bill uh, over the winter. And of course, in, um, instinctively, it feels wrong to give the power for targets to come down in future. We always want to be driving for more ambition to do better and go further. So it, it feels wrong uh, to allow that mechanism for targets to come down. But this uh, is part of the, um, the proposal which has been put forward for an inventory freeze to protect um, annual targets from the, the baseline changes and the inventories. So, if, um, so we're quite content that that, that mechanism to bring targets down as well as up um, is, is insulated within that particular part of the bill and that there are significant safeguards that would ensure that the uh, bringing targets down can only be done with advice, can only be done if it's because of an inventory change and can only be done um, in terms of regulation and brought before Parliament for scrutiny. Okay. Right, we're going to move on to questions from Finlay Carson. 
Thanks. Uh, section 5 sets out the, the target setting criteria, including scientific knowledge, technology, energy policy, and so on. And uh, it's been updated since the, the, the 2009 Act to include current international carbon reporting practices. Um, what I would like to ask is whether you think that the target setting criteria is appropriate, uh, and, and maybe consider what Stop Climate Change Scotland suggested that we needed a tighter definition for um, fair and safe when it came to um, the objectives of not exceeding uh, fair and safe uh, emissions budgets. Could you consider uh, whether they're, they're appropriate now? Anyone would like to answer that? Carolyn Vance. Um, so, uh, if I can answer the, the fair and safe budget uh, first. So, there was actually a proposal in the consultation to remove this criterion of meeting a fair and safe Scottish emissions budget. Um, we're very pleased to see that that has been kept in. That's, uh, that's the sort of fundamental, basic, overarching criteria that we should be considering when we're setting our climate targets. Um, so we're very pleased that it's there. We would like to see a strengthening in the definition. So the definition as it stands refers more to the, the safe part of the fair and safe budget. It doesn't really uh, reflect the, the fair aspect. So we would certainly like to see that amended to include the UNFCCC principles of equity and common but differentiated responsibility. And we would like to see a requirement for the CCC to calculate on what our fair and safe emissions budget is whenever they're asked to do the five yearly advice and to take that into consideration. Um, in terms of whether the, the target setting criteria is still relevant, um, that you're right, there's quite a long list here of, of different criteria. Um, as I said, we consider the fair and safe criteria and uh, our obligations uh, under science and under the UNFCCC protocols to be the, the most important, and perhaps the ones that come underneath that are really more about how we implement the policies. Gina Hanrahan. Uh, criterion that we see as, as notably missing um, is, is something around public health. So we, we have a lot of other factors that are under consideration, but I think a lot of the um, policies that tackle climate change have huge co-benefits in terms of public health. If you think about insulating people's homes and protecting them from damp, drafty homes, if you think about uh, encouraging people where appropriate to get out of their cars and, and, and uh, cycling and walking, all of those things can have massive public health benefits. So these are all about avoided costs for the NHS as much as anything else. And I think we need to make sure that the CCC can balance that in its, in its criteria. Air pollution is another one that could go in separately or be considered under that criterion. Yeah, just quickly, uh, Caroline talked about the, like, the top three uh, being like the, the top criteria because they're the ones that you know scientifically are important but also I think point point J on the, in the which is environmental considerations and in particular likely impact of targets on biodiversity is also you know a really top criteria because when we're setting targets it has to help it has to make sure that we don't impact on our wildlife and, and, and wildlife around the globe okay right we're going to move on to questions from Stuart Stevenson uh, thank you uh, very much um, and just to make sure I ask the question in the right context, um, I wanted to just make sure we had a shared understanding of what net zero target uh, means. It, basically, I think it's covered in the bill at sections one and sections 15, um, and is net zero. And clearly, that means there will still be emissions, um, not least because I'm speaking and therefore creating carbon dioxide, as we all do, uh, there will be emissions. And there appeared to be a suggestion in some of the contributions earlier that we were looking to zero each of the seven gases. And I just wanted to be clear that that's... Right, I'm getting a shake of the head. That's not what we mean. Right, let me therefore move to the question uh, as, as, as such. And it's in relation to the advice the Climate Change Committee gives the, uh, the government and that we therefore all see. How should the word achievable be defined? because I think a lot of it, the debate anchors round different views of what achievable means. Yeah. Hannah, Hannah. Um, I think that's a really, really fundamental question to this bill. And I think uh, what this bill does, as opposed to the previous act, is give achievability a status that it never had. Previously, feasibility technology was one of the criteria that had to be balanced a number of, along with a number of other factors, science, economics, et cetera. 
when the CCC was giving advice. Here at the CCC, the only reason we would set a net zero target is if we know it's achievable. Now, what does achievable mean? As Jim Ski made clear in the first session uh, to this committee, uh, the IPCC have six layers of, uh, of how they consider feasibility from the geophysical um, through to techno-economic, through, um, through to kind of socio-political, if you like. I think the really big question about whether or not this is achievable is, is there enough political will to, uh, to put this in place. Um, so I, I think uh, the feasibility conversation, as I've already alluded to, has, has moved on considerably, but I would really caution against giving it this paramount status in the bill. Just before I move on, are we also talking about technical issues? I mean, 10 years ago, we thought tidal energy was one of the big things. Nothing has happened in that. But in other areas of electricity generation, we've greatly surpassed. So our ability to see the future is pretty limited. So uh, is, is it important we also look at technical possibilities? Yes, I think we absolutely have to uh, explore what the, uh, the innovation potential is for Scotland. And I think we have you know, enormous research expertise here uh, that we would like to see exploited towards a low carbon transition. Uh, I think a lot of the CCC analysis to date has kind of centred on the technological feasibility. Um, so they do very extensive economic modelling um, and uh, they look at what uh, their models tell them at any given point in time. But uh, feasibility is, is an evolutionary concept. It, we can't capture it at one moment in time for all time. Um, so uh, we need to find ways to um, ensure that the new pathways that are coming forward are, are adequately uh, legislated for. I think the Cabinet Secretary, to paraphrase her, has said, show me the pathway and I will legislate for it. Now, I think... Do forgive me, I'm watching the clock as well as the community. I know Caroline Rance wanted to come Fine. in. Uh, yeah, I just want to reflect, you say the ability to see the future is pretty limited, but actually what the IPCC report did was very accurately paint the picture of what the impacts are that we're facing if we do not do this. So I think the question should be less about what does achievable mean and should we really be actually using that in our target setting criteria rather than legislating for what's necessary. Okay, Theresa Anderson. Thank you. And, and, and I think what the IPCC scenarios also did was look at um, what was achievable, but not constraining themselves by what was con perceived to be politically achievable at the time. Um, and because that can move very quickly once the politics changes as well. So, so I think it's a good question. How do you define achievability? I would go with the IPCC um, model of what is, you know, what is ne necessary and showing the pathways that could be done, actually, if we set our minds for it. Stuart, are you? Uh, yes, I'll skip the next bullet point. I think most of it's been covered. Um, the, the, uh, the other thing that's uh, come up uh, in particular, uh, I think Caroline seemed to indicate that it might be worth considering in some circumstances uh, changing targets. But I just wondered, reading uh, the bill, which is moving to expressing targets uh, uh, in percentages, whereas previously the 2009 Act did in tons. So rebaselining blew the targets off arithmetically. But the new bill moves to percentages. Does that not, in fact, remove the need to, for considering reducing targets? Because rebaselining will no longer have the effects that it previously had. So the problem that we had with the 2009 Act was actually that um, some of the targets were expressed in percentage terms, whereas some of the targets were expressed yeah. Yeah. in megatons. So whenever yeah. we changed the baselines, it was the, the difference between the targets that were in megatons and the targets that were in percentage that threw the problem. I would just like to reiterate on bringing targets down. I don't want to see targets um, coming back down. I always would like to see them going up. Um, but it's, uh, that safeguard is, or that mechanism is there um, should there be, for example, particularly uh, big changes to the inventory, to the, the measurement science, essentially, that would require change. Okay, we're going to have to move on. Um, Gina Small Hanover, bit. yeah. Point on that. Um, where we move to percentages, which is a, a move that we absolutely support, I think it's important that we still have a, a view to Scotland's total emissions. So that's where the CCC recommendations on a, a total fair and safe cumulative budget continue to be important, and we need an update to that. Angus MacDonald. 
Yeah, thanks, um, Convener. We haven't really touched on uh, carbon credits this morning, um, so uh, I'd certainly be keen to hear how the, or whether the panel agrees with the, the government's approach to retaining an option uh, to use carbon credits, and in what circumstances uh, might this power be used, to, you know, for example, to achieve a net zero target. Okay. Anyone else want to pick up on that? Okay. We'll go to Gina Hanran first and I'll come to Caroline afterwards. So I think just to clarify what the bill does, essentially it reverses um, the uh, position in the existing Act uh, to the default position uh, where we, we could use credits. Now we will have to proactively seek to use credits in the future, but we can still use uh, up to 20% in any given year. Um, I think there's a question about what is realistic in terms of carbon credits by 2050. We're going to be an increasingly carbon constrained world. They are not going to be floating around uh, extensively. If they are, they're going to be at enormous price. Um, so I think it's right that we should seek to, um, to use or to, to uh, push forward as much as possible on domestic action. Um, because I think realistically credits will not be uh, around long term. I think there's an interesting question about how does flexibility work at a global level in a, in a net zero world. We have some scope for carbon storage and other things that other countries may not have, more scope for afforestation, but that's different from the carbon credits question. Carolyn Rance. Um, so certainly Friends of the Earth Scotland, whenever the, the 2009 Act was coming through, argued against the inclusion of carbon credits, um, that there was a compromise then to, to put a limit on the use of credits, uh, which Froze was reasonably content with. Um, but I think it's just fair to say that, you know, Jim talked quite extensively earlier on about the great capacity that we have in Scotland for sequestration, for enhancing our carbon sinks. It's highly unlikely that Scotland is going to need to use credits at all. Um, and uh, the Cabinet Secretary has certainly said that the Scottish Government doesn't intend to use them, uh, and we would be minded to agree that we don't need to use them. I guess, uh, are you...? Yeah, well, just, um, Gina mentioned the 20% limit. Um, I'd be keen to, to, to hear the panel's view on, on uh, um, you know, whether um, that's, you know, a suitable percentage. <laughs> Certainly, um, it, it's not a, a conversation that we've had about what exactly is the appropriate limit. I think it's very hard to say um, what that should be. What the principles are is that we should absolutely exploit all possible domestic action first. Um, and I think also it's critical that we, uh, we, we don't think about credits in the short term. These are, you know, the that is a long-term conversation, but at that point, that they're not going to be available, and they're going to be—if they are—they're going to be extraordinarily expensive. Thanks. Um, we'll move on to questions from Richard Lyle. Yes, thank you, Convener. Um, the bill rationalises the annual report produced by Section 3334 of the 2009 Act, so it only contains only information directly related to outcome of the emissions reduction target for the relevant year. So, in the Lordship sort of uh, question way, is the panel content or not content with the new approach to an annual reporting? And are there advantages or disadvantages to annual sectoral reporting on the climate change plan? Anyone content or not content? Yep. Carolyn Vance. Uh, so certainly we're content with the change to the annual reporting. I'm sure the, the committee will be aware that the 2009 Act set the, the statutory report every October um, to talk about annual targets, but because the reports were actually ready in June, that's when we ended up having the statement. So we ended up in this situation where we would have the statement in June and then again in October. So we were just duplicating uh, content. So uh, what the bill does is uh, legislate for the target results to be in June and then using that October statement to talk more about progress on the policies and that's definitely welcome so it means that in June we can look at the, the big picture of how we're doing against the targets and then the opportunity on October uh, allows us to look at how we're progressing against the policies in the climate change plan so how are we doing with the policies that we've said we'll deliver in transport how are we doing in agriculture and energy efficiency so it allows for an additional level of scrutiny in in all sectors and all departments to really see how uh, how effort is faring so we definitely welcome that okay anyone else 
Yeah. Yep. Everybody's, everybody's content. That, that's good. <laughs> it's really nice to see everybody's agreeing with each other. Um, so, finally, the committee previously recommended there should be no limit on Parliament in considering the climate change plan. So, what's the panel's view on a 90 day limit for consideration of the climate change plan? Jim Densham. Um, this again was something that we we touched upon uh, in the, some of us uh, in, in a technical discussions with the, with government, and uh, what I think what the problem was with the last climate change plan it was it was far too short a, a amount of time for for us to get comments in and, and organisations to get comments and then for committee to look at it and Parliament to give their opinion. So it was it was kind of too short. So there was kind of there was various options about longer and shorter and, and uh, we were I think we were content with this one if I'm, with this amount of time, I think. Karen Lavance. Yeah, there's there's certainly a balance to be struck um, between allowing Parliament and stakeholders a significant amount of time to adequately scrutinise the plan and making sure that we drive it forward and get to the implementation stage. Um, so I, I think we just need to be cognizant of that, that need to make sure that it doesn't just drift on open-endedly. Jean Hanrahan. I think there's an important point as well about um, the length of time between the final report from committees and when the government produces its final plan. And that was a very long period of time in this context, up to, I think, nine months from the initial parliamentary scrutiny to the final climate change plan. And actually, to be fair, very little changed. In fact, in some ways, we went backwards from the initial plan uh, in that nine month period. So ensuring during that period that there is a real opportunity for constructive, substantive discussions on how to improve the plan. <coughs> Final question from John Scott. Thank you, uh, convener, for your indulgence. And I just want to go back to carbon credits a little. And uh, Gina Hanran may feel she's already answered this question, but just for clarity, in my own mind, in, in correspondence, the Scottish Government said that the estimated cost of using credits to make up the gap between what is technically feasible domestically here in Scotland and a net zero emission target in 2050 could be around £15 billion pounds over the period to 2050. Uh, you'll, I'm sure, know how that pathway is derived. Do you just want to pass any comment on that? Did you say, essentially, that there wouldn't be any carbon to be bought or sold, so it wouldn't be a cost? So my understanding of how that figure has been reached is essentially the Scottish Government has taken um, uh, the trajectory from 2030 to 2050 and the, the gap between a 90% target and a net zero target yeah, yeah. and applied uh, current understandings of the future uh, price, uh, maybe it's current carbon credit price or future carbon credit price to that. Now, that is an odd sum to do, if you like, because we know we have not exhausted all domestic effort. And why would we invest 15 billion in carbon credits when we could be investing 15 billion to create a thriving low carbon economy with all the co-benefits we've, we've outlined? So I think that that analysis is not particularly robust. Well, no, it's a very good point that you've made them. Did it with others with share that, that view? Um, uh, one of the reasons why I think Gina is referring to the lack of availability of carbon credits um, in other countries is because the Paris Agreement now requires all countries to develop their own NDCs. So any low-hanging fruits that under the Kyoto Protocol countries, let's say, uh, the Gabon would have sold their carbon, sold their yeah. mitigation savings as a carbon credit. These are now going to be part of their domestic action plans, which could actually be funded by climate finance directly, not necessarily as carbon offsets, and that would be an excellent thing. But, um, but, uh, but that is why these are now going to be used up by by countries and not freely available. And anything else that is available is not going to be the low-hanging fruit and cost-efficient, but the very high, high-cost measures. Okay. Thank finally, you very much. Carolyn Vance. Uh, I actually think the answer to this question is perhaps less to do with whether there's credits available and uh, more in terms of what would be considered to be technically feasible. What we haven't touched on is the fact that the CCC are going to be coming back in a few months with new advice. That's right. It's pretty inconceivable to think that after the IPCC report, after they take on board, you know, they're, they're going to update their models, they're going to significantly update their advice, they're going to bring in the IPCC findings. It's, it's pretty inconceivable to n imagine that when they do all of this, they're going to come back with a picture uh, and say nothing is going to change. We're pretty sure that they're going to come back with much stronger targets for 2030 and for 2050. And uh, indeed, earlier this month, they were 
uh, advertising a vacancy for a net zero emissions analyst. So I think we can take from that what you will. <laughs> but sa sadly, sadly, we have run out of time. Um, sorry to anybody that wanted to come in with that supplementary questions, but um, if, if there's anything that anyone ever feels that they didn't get a chance to say, they can of course contact the committee. So I want to thank everyone for their evidence this morning. Very, very helpful, very useful. I'm going to suspend this meeting for five minutes to allow the change of panels. Thank you.
Right. I'm delighted to welcome our second panel of witnesses this morning. Uh, joining us are Dr Diana Casey, the Senior Advisor of Energy and Climate Change, Mineral Products Asso Association. Professor Paul Jowett of Heriot Watt University. Elizabeth Layton, Director of Existing Homes Alliance Scotland. Fabrice Levesque, Senior Policy Manager of Scottish, Scottish Renewables. And Will Webster, en Energy Policy Manager for Oil & Gas UK. Welcome to you all. Um, I'm going to start off with the same, for those of you that were in the gallery and watching the previous session, I asked the, the previous panel um, about whether you think the bill complies with the Paris Agreement and, of course, the more recent IPCC report. If anyone would like to, if you have any views on whether it does or doesn't. Elizabeth Layton. Sure, should we uh, just kick off and um, thank you for inviting me along and for those who aren't familiar with the Existing Homes Alliance, it is a coalition of housing and environmental industry, um, fuel poverty bodies that come together on this uh, agenda of improving our existing homes, housing stock for both climate change and fuel poverty objectives. In terms of the, the question about whether or not the bill meets the ambition of the Paris Agreement, um, as you'll guess, our focus is very much on, on energy efficiency and, how, and if the bill is actually providing the, the plans and the, the direction, the targets that would support achieving an overall very ambitious um, climate change target for Scotland. And we would argue that it doesn't. That it, that, and we have argued for the bill to include measures that would progress action on this very important topic of energy efficiency, which we think, um, we believe there is you know, cross-party support for more action on energy efficiency in this parliament. And we do have a very strong, you know, an energy efficient Scotland program that has been put forward, but it is lacking a statutory underpinning. And so we've argued for that statutory framework for energy efficient Scotland to be included in this bill. And that would include targets. It would include um, the setting up of, of an oversight budget and to make sure that the budget was aligned with meeting those energy efficient targets as well. Okay, anyone else want to make some points for Bruce Levesque? Hi, good morning. Uh, yeah, thanks for inviting us along. Um, for those of you who don't know Scottish Renewables, we're the Industry Association for Renewable Energy in Scotland. Uh, we represent about 250 members, in the, primarily in the electricity and the heat sectors, and that ranges from developers, uh, installers, manufacturers, um, to kind of the legal and professional services um, that provide uh, renewable energy. Um, in answer to the question, I guess, from our perspective, the, we understand the bill to be an interpretation of the Paris Agreement, which um, increased climate change um, ambitions from kind of below two degrees to aiming for 1.5 degrees. And for us, the, that means really setting a political signal to businesses, to consumers of the future direction of travel. I think for us, that's particularly crucial as an industry that can provide the solutions because uh, we are quite a highly regulated industry and Political risk is something that has to be managed. Uh, political risk affects investment, in in affects the, the long-term supply chain decisions that, that we make, and a lot of the long-term infrastructure that we build. So for a, that signal to be effective and clear, we need to know what we're aiming for and by when. And I think that's, that's what's key for us, really, in, in understanding the bill. It's, it's knowing that there's a firm political commitment, and that can actually be translated into policy um, in terms of when uh, we need to Im reduce emissions by and the, the level at which that needs to be done. Okay. Anyone else want to make any points? <laughs> Professor Jarrett. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm probably a bit more of a generalist here than, than most of the other panellists and the, the previous panellists. Um, my guess is obviously the bill is intended to meet the Paris Declaration. I think in broad terms it, it's seeking to do that. But I can well understand that people from particular areas have got particular misgivings about certain aspects of it. So, in a sense, my, my responses this morning will be, from a slightly more generalist point of view, if it helps the panel, it, it might be useful to say what my background is. Um, I'm an academic at Harriet Watt. For 15 years, I ran the Scottish Institute of Sustainable Technology, which was a, a spin-out from Harriet Watt, and originally Scottish Enterprise, and then uh, consultancy. Um, I'm a past president of the Institution of 
civil engineer, so um, John Scott is one of my members, I think, or was one of my members. Um, um, I'm also actually on the prize committee for the Saltire Marine Energy Prize, which was uh, referenced earlier on in, in terms of um, tidal energy being the hope of the future, but um, has yet to fulfil its dream. Um, my interests are really in, in systems analysis, taking the big picture and the decision making. And so my comments this morning will reflect that kind of position. Thank you very much. Okay. I mean, obviously, I'm just going to go to Bill Webster anyway. I mean, obviously, your sector, there's a lot of asks of your sector, and it would be interesting to know just what, what the buy-in has been to something that, you know, on on the surface of it, might look like something that is going to mean the demise of oil and gas. As yeah, we um, well, we, just briefly, we represent around 400 members, and that's not just um, exploration and production companies, it's also a vast range of... Uh, supply chain businesses and infrastructure owners, um, and the, the they are keen. They are following this discussion very closely, and uh, you know our members are you know very much engaged in the whole energy transition as enabling that. Uh, whether that's in terms of providing services to alternative energy providers or or direct investment. Um, so I just wanted to pick up on you know the 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 targets. I mean what we've seen in the first. Uh, phase of the energy transition is you know, rapid progress can be achieved if the targets are aligned and in step with the technological possibilities, consumer acceptability, and then what's going on in politics and society. And we think that's really got to be a key part of the next phase of how uh, targets are set. Um, you know, the point about just transition that was made in the last session, I think you know, we would pick up on that in a couple of ways in the sense of you know, the positive story to tell there is the success of the oil and gas sector, um, which has um, then contributed to offshore um, investment as well. And that, you know, that it's more of a positive story to be told about what, what advantage we can take of the expertise, um, the investment um, historically, and the, um, the, the hundreds and thousands of um, workers in the sector, not just in Scotland, but all across the UK. Are you preparing for this transition? I mean, and I ask, as a, also as a constituency MSP for the Aberdeenshire, how much are you preparing for, I would say, the inevitability that thousands of people mm. who now currently work in oil mm. and gas we may have to look for, to other sectors as we, we, we try to tackle climate change? We, um, I mean, we, we're, we're looking at the issue in a couple of time frames. Um, the, 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 the time frame to 2035, which um, was mentioned earlier, so at that point in time, we envisage that the, or its base is forecast actually, that um, the UK will still be using oil and gas for about uh, three quarters of its energy needs. Um, and our projections for production in, in, the, in the North Sea up to that point, we will always be below what, what, the, what the UK, the production level is, is still going to be below the consumption level, even in the you know, fairly ambitious targets that are being set. So we're not actually competing uh, with you know, renewables investment and other sources of supply. So um, we, we, we've developed a vision for, um, you know, the next stage of investment in the North Sea to run to about 2035, and that's the adding an extra generation of production. So we're trying to maintain production, you know, not at the current levels, which is around 1.7 million barrels a day, but just down to, you know, to manage the decline in production to about 1.1 million, barrel, million barrel, barrels a day. After that, you know, there are, as, as was said in the earlier session, you know, there, there are quite a few uncertainties about where different technologies will go. And you know, we really see the need for quite a flexible approach that can take account of um, how, how technology develops, how consumer acceptability develops, and how society and political discussion moves. And that's you know, why we actually appreciate the flexibility that's provided in the bill uh, for, for the government to take account of advice to, to revise as, as, as it go, goes on and to um, have a kind of iterative process to target setting. In, in terms of, should there be a, a shift, should there be a preparation for the shift in the use of hydrocarbons that does not include heat and uh, electricity su supply? I mean, is there an acceptance that you're, you're, if we are going to be taking 
oil out the ground, mm. that it might be for a different use than what is currently being used for? Well, we could, yeah, I mean, if we, if we I, I think we see that there's quite the pol policy, you know, if you look at the carbon reductions that have been achieved so far, all in the electricity sector, more or less, a lot of them, um, a lot of that has come from increased use of gas, for one thing. Uh, so there's been a lot of coal to gas switching, which has reduced emissions, and obviously the success of offshore renewables in particular. Um, if we look forward, I think we, we see that there's quite a crossroads in policy, particularly on heat and industrial processes. And that's where we see CCS needs, really needs um, to have the next stage of development so that uh, you know, there is a, a really clear government policy, all, both developing a commercial and a regulatory framework and also the legislation around um, CCS, the use of decarbonised gas, the development of the hydrogen economy. These are all things that our members are you know, actively investing in and ha carrying out research and development. So you know, they're, 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 they are ready to enable some of this transition into particularly the, particularly the use of decarbonised gas and hydrogen. And that's you know, got to be an important part of the climate change plans that are developed off the back of this legislation. Okay, Mark Ruskell has a supplementary uh, question. I mean, on, on the face of it, the, the signs are really not looking good for your sector globally. Uh, New Zealand is no longer issuing permits for offshore oil and gas exploration. Uh, countries around the world are banning the sale of petrol and diesel cars by 2030. Sweden's banned uh, the use of fossil fuels in heating, coming to force the next two years. Governor of the Bank of England is talking about stranded assets, warning markets not to invest in your sector. So. Your, your submission to the committee is quite bullish about the role of oil and gas going forward, but what, what, what's your plan B? Because well, we, on the face of it, the sector looks finished. Well, we see actually a pretty good future for the next 10 or 15 years or so in, in, in the sector, and it's a sector that really needs investment, actually, both in the UK and globally. Um, so even if you look at the IEAs... What happens after 15 well, years? Because with jobs that are, we, you know, need you know, to transition. We, we have to, uh, and that comes into the discussion about, you know, a just transition that maintains reliable services for consumers. Um, so we, you know, if you look at any of the global forecasts, you know, done by the International Energy Agency, for example, even in their sustainable development scenario, there's a gap that emerges on supply of oil and ga gas globally. So... You know, if, we, if we're thinking about how, the, how Scotland and the UK is, has, have become global leaders in climate policy, which they are, um, it's by setting, you know, stretching but real, realistic targets, hitting them and without um, damaging the consensus behind making progress um, in climate policy. And it's not every country that's managed to do that. So it's really important that the setting of targets is done in a flexible way that allows um, that those policies to be developed, which are credible, to bring about investment, what, the investment that's needed in the conventional sector as well as the alternative sector, so that the transition is something that you know is difficult, but it's it, it's something that uh, consumers and the economy can take. And you know this is this is really an important feature you, of climate policy. Do you accept needed. there'll be an endpoint for oil and gas? Um, when is that going to be? Decarbonised gas has got to be part of the long-term picture, I mean, and even oil. I mean, even if even if you took all of the um, even if you took all of passenger vehicles and light-duty vehicles, that's about 30 million tonnes of oil equivalent out of a total demand of at the moment of about 150 for oil and gas. So there's a lot of other uses um, for oil and gas which are in you know, difficult to decarbonise sectors: industry, heavy goods transport, marine transport, and aviation. And these things all need to be. Will all need to be serviced over the next over the next decades. Still, from oil and gas. Okay, move on to questions from Finlay Carson. Thank you. Uh, the, the, the proposed uh, bill only amends uh, reduction targets <laughs> and reporting duties. Um, so the, the consultation is focused on strategic ambition, uh, not delivery mechanisms. So should increased target setting be considered, uh, without realistically considering what what will be required to meet the targets? <coughs> Dr Casey. Um, I, th I think our, our main issue is actually the, the delivery rather than the targets themselves. Um, the industries I represent are um, energy intensive um, and the key thing is competitiveness. So in meeting those targets, it's how is that burden shared across different sectors of the economy. Um, 
our sectors, along with power, have taken considerable action already. And I think when you go to those stretching targets, it's kind of how can you achieve that? The focus has to change from those sectors that have already done a lot to maybe other sectors that are harder harder to decarbonise. Not saying our sectors shouldn't carry on decarbonising. De um, we've got kind of roadmaps showing how we can get there. Um, but I think we've definitely, we've got to protect the competitiveness because the materials we supply are vital to other sectors decarbonising, to the low carbon economy transition, um, and also to climate change adaptation. Um, so, so our key thing is, is how the burden is shared and it is actually in that delivery rather than the targets themselves. Elizabeth Leighton. Um, yes, we've argued that the inclusion of measures um, regarding to energy efficiency and targets relating to that um, sector would be in scope because it is part of plans to support the transition. It's building on the previous Climate Change Act, which did include a significant section on energy efficiency policy. And also this new bill is framed in terms of setting emission reduction targets. Um, so, so we believe it's compatible with the principles of the bill. Um, but that aside, you know, in terms of the me mechanics, um, onto the question of need, um, there's, I think what you've already heard a bit around the table is that targets are essential in terms of driving innovation, providing certainty for business, and there's been evidence provided to um, this stage one scrutiny on the fact that, you know, we're, we're risking winning all the economic benefits, the jobs benefits, and also those to the wider economy, if we're not providing that certainty to business to invest and for homeowners to invest. So having that clear pathway set in statute will, will also give them, give them more confidence to, to go ahead and, and invest, and then we can win those jobs benefits rather than seeing them gradually leaking to other parts of the UK or even Europe. Um, because our supply chain hasn't developed. So I think it's critical that, that we do have the targets, we have the statutory underpinning, even in the UK CCC progress report to the Parliament where they highlighted the Energy Efficient Scotland programme as an exemplar for other sectors. They specifically talk about um, that, that it has, there's a statutory underpinning to the commitments, and I would argue that there isn't a statutory underpinning unless something is included in this bill. Um, and, I, and I should add that we're aware that the government has indicated that um, there is a potential for consideration of an energy efficient Scotland bill at some point in the future. But failing any firm commitment to that or what it might contain, I, I fear that uh, we would be uh, failing uh, the chances of meeting the climate change targets if it weren't included in this bill now, taking the opportunity at hand, avoiding further delays, and actually timing quite well with the implementation of Energy Efficient Scotland, which will go into implementation phase from 2020. Pat, Ruby Slovic. Thanks. I guess I'd like to make a couple of points. Um, in terms of, kind of near-term delivery, if the question is, are there areas that, uh, of current climate policy in Scotland that could be improved? Yes. Um, there are um, areas of planning policy um, for us, as well as heat policy that could be improved. And I guess a bill is always an opportunity to do that. In terms of whether the target works as a long-term signal, um, as I said earlier, it's about setting the problem and allowing us to work out the solution. I guess at the moment, the, the way it's phrased, it's kind of saying we, we will... Uh, endeavour to get to net zero. That's, that's roughly the ambition. Those are words that we can point to as an industry, but that's very different to a firm target with a, a number and a date. Um, in terms of policy risk, if you're looking at that as a business and someone says, we, there's a line in a bill that says, there are some words that say, this is roughly what we're aiming towards. That's very different to, there are some clear targets with dates, with numbers attached. So. A firmer target does give us uh, feeds back into giving us that greater clarity and certainty. And the, the final point is around, uh, I guess it's been touched on here a little bit, I think around the kind of technical feasibility and whether we should set a target now, given the uncertainty around driving those last few emissions out of the system. I'd just like to make a point around long-term targets and near-term ones. 
So for near-term targets, say the 2020 renewables targets, they have to be uh, achievable because it has to be something we think we can get to that will instill confidence. In terms of long-term targets, so we're talking about uh, the 2050 target being more than 30 years away. That's much more around saying, here's where we'd like to be. That's setting a challenge and allowing us to work out the solutions. So I'd just like to clarify, I think near term, absolutely, and we have to be grounded in what's, what's f feasible. I think longer term, given the scale that we're talking about and the time there is to work out the solutions, you have to kind of allow that to come into play as well. Well, Webster? Uh, uh, ambitious targets and, and credible ambitious targets are good in that they provide uh, credibility to investors and allow them to modify their strategies and think about how what sort of businesses they want to be in future and uh, the same goes for households to some extent so I think there, there's a positive aspect to uh, ambitious targets that are you know, based in uh, on, on evidence of what what uh, what uh, is achievable uh, and what can be uh, delivered in terms of consumer acceptability so I think we, we, and I think there's a positive essence that in that it gives it gives policymakers cover for giving you know strong positive incentives to investors, so that will deliver the investment that's needed. And I think that's the that's a bit the experience of the first phase of uh, decarbonisation, in that the the initial set of targets allowed some positive policies to be developed that really brought about a significant amount of investment from the private sector. In, in, in those particular technologies. And you know, there, there's a lesson to be learned there, I think, for the, for the next phase too. Professor Jarrett. Just on the, the business of long-term targets, it doesn't mean to say that um, you can leave them and not do anything about them. They, they have to be start to deal with them now. Um, so far, uh, some of the big hits on carbon reduction in Scotland and in the UK generally and in the developing world have all been made by exporting our carbon emissions to the to developing countries and re-importing goods. That's been a kind of a quick win for us in some ways. Um, but the longer term targets, I think, are going to involve a degree of behavioural change. And that is much more difficult to, um, to, to do and needs to be started now. The other issue, of course, is, is that um, if you look at long term targets, you very quickly get um, if, in the decision making world of politics involved in discounted cash flow uh, and discounting and of course the reality of discounting is it discounts the future by definition that's what it says on the tin so in order to uh, deal with these we need to start making investments now in order to get the long-term uh, benefits that we need um, I, I, it's large-scale complex problems are not easily dealt with by cost-benefit analysis to be honest I, I once gave a talk in Australia on climate change and international development and I said to this audience of admittedly mainly engineers, um, the two most important decisions you make in your life are your house and your partner. And who amongst you in this audience has ever made any of those decisions using that method? One person put their hand up. I have to say it was a man. And I, I didn't ask him whether it was the wife or the house, but clearly large scale problems need something more mature for a decision making mechanism than some of the instruments that are commonly used in government and by treasuries. And the world is at a critical point and we need to start making long term decisions and the actions to get there now, otherwise it will be too late. Mr. Carson. A, a supplementary uh, Professor Joe, you, you'd suggested you had misgivings in your opening statement. Um, and well, you also talked about <laughs> credible targets. Is, is there a risk that if we don't have credible targets, we'll not take the investors that we so desperately need uh, following the process? Well, well, simply yes. I mean, I think we, we do need to start making real decisions that are going to have a real impact and not whiffle waffle ones. And I think, you know, just to underline the point, um, um, credible targets allow policymakers to develop credible policies. So. The, the, the feed through from the target into the climate change plans into actual policies and you know the, making climate policies is not an easy task so you need to give yourself the appropriate framework for doing that as, as, as a government um, and that comes from having you know, targets that are in tune with what is going on and what 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 we think will be going on in the next 20 years supplementary question from mark ruskell 
We heard some really useful, interesting evidence at the beginning um, of our scrutiny of this bill from uh, Swedish sectors. And they were discussing how the Swedish government put in place working with industry sector action plans, particularly around the steel sector and the cement sector. I'm just wondering what, where you see the UK in terms of, of that kind of sectoral approach. Are we, have we got enough focus on the really transformative technologies and linking that into where the sectors themselves see themselves in, in terms of global markets and the way they're positioning their, their products and their services? Um, probably not. But um, we also need to be careful that we, that we don't lull everybody into this idea that technology is going to fix this. It does need some, some of us to change what we do as individuals rather than just hope that um, technology is going to come on with the magic bullet and, and solve it all for, all, for us. Um, I'll maybe come back to that a bit later if, 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 if you like. Thank you. Dr Casey. Yeah, we have um, an action plan uh, for the UK cement sector which was produced on the back of the uh, roadmap that was published in 2015 that the sector um, produced in combination with government, um, UK government. Um, the action plan isn't exactly what we thought it was going to be. We were hoping that, you know, we've got the roadmap, it shows what reductions can be made and, and the barriers to those and the main technologies. And we were hoping that the action plan would then put in place what we need to get there. Um, and it doesn't go quite that far, but it's the start of a conversation with government and we've really valued that. Um, we know the three technologies that will help that will decarbonise the cement sector. Um, one of them is CCUS, which is the breakthrough technology. Um, the sector itself has done a lot of research. Um, we're at the point; a lot of the projects are in Europe rather than the UK. Uh, but all of MPA and uh, the majority of our members are involved. Um, and a couple of them are at the point where we need funding for demonstration projects. So we're not expecting everyone to do the work for us. Um, we need support, though. It's, uh, you know, I think it's about 90 million euros we need to do these two demonstration projects. And I think at the moment, that's, they're kind of on hold until we get the EU ETS Phase 4 Innovation Fund. So it's just finding the support to help. And you know, industry has committed a considerable amount of that as well. Um, but, but yeah, there's, there's definitely work to be done. Are you concerned then about the hiatus that we might have with the ETS after Brexit and whether we're still going to see the same kind of level of funds going into these innovation funds if we end up with a carbon tax for a year or a return to an ETS but under a very different guise? Or? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the innovation fund, we're sort of, I wouldn't want to say pinning our hopes on it, but, you know, it is going to be quite a good source of support for those kinds of projects. And... I mean, Brexit introduces a huge amount of uncertainty. Um, the carbon tax, I think we're, we'd be worried about for other reasons. You know, I think as a sector, we would like emissions reduction at lowest cost. Um, the carbon tax that the Chancellor announced at £16 a tonne of CO2, we think would render us in uncompetitive because in a no deal Brexit situation, the chances are the carbon price will crash. So we would then be paying far higher than our competitors in Europe would be. And, and that leads on to the you know, carbon leakage that um, Professor Jarrett's mentioned. Um, so that is a real concern. What's at the limit of technical feasibility then with your sector? Um, the technology definitely exists and there's work to be done to get it to that commercial deployment. And uh, Professor Jarrett wanted to say just something. A, just a brief follow-up. I mean, I, the, I mean, the advances in um, cement production have been you know, quite remarkable, I think, in the last period. But you have to bear in mind that in terms of, the, in terms of construction, um, you have to distinguish between what you might call capex carbon and opex carbon. And opex carbon, i.e. energy efficiency in use, is, will dominate the, the, the carbon budget of any construction project. You, know, so you, could, you, could make a, you could construct a bridge you, with very little amount of carbon in terms of building it, but it's the traffic usage over the bridge that's going to be the killer. And that and doesn't really impact on that. I, I, there was reference made a minute ago to also to, to carbon tax and carbon trading. I, I'd, I'd be very worried if, if anybody pinned the future of uh, the planet on the, on, the, on the market and hoped it would come to save you. It won't. 
Uh, yeah, it's the idea that when the carbon price drops by 20% on Monday, does that mean somehow the value of the planet has fallen by 20%? Of course it doesn't. So we need to be very careful the extent to which we rely on the market to fix the, uh, the CO2 problem. And now to questions from Rhoda Grant. Thank you. Um, I think we're all agreed we need transformational change um, to meet the targets, but sometimes that change leaves people behind. Um, so how can we do this in a fair and just manner? Um, and things like we've heard before, um, the movement to electric vehicles, that's fine if you can afford it. Um, house, you know, making sure that your house um, is insulated and has all the, the, the latest renewables on it. People who can afford that do that and, and actually end up saving money, so they're, they're, there's a win-win. But those who don't have the money can't do that, so they miss out twice and are penalised because of taxation and the like to discourage um, use of um, energy. Um, yes, I'm really pleased you asked that question because I think that's, that's part of the tr just transition is that it, you know, it has to be fair for users of energy as well. And so there's a real issue in terms of fuel poverty of um, making sure that the low carbon transition doesn't lead to unaffordable energy, just when we're trying to tackle fuel poverty so um, um, in such a big commitment coming from the government in that way. And I think actually with energy efficiency, you know, we have a chance to redress the balance between rural and urban. We have a chance to actually invest in those properties that have been neglected for, you know, many of the programs that have existed to date and, and actually say, you know, no, there's going to be greater investment there so that they would be amongst the first places to benefit from the low carbon transition by investment in um, moving from a very expensive oil heat over to um, some kind of renewable heat and very energy efficient properties. And, and so I think it's, it's an example actually where, where they will benefit from these low regrets options that are available now and should be taken forward as part of the fuel poverty program for those who can't afford it. They should be part of that warmer home Scotland and, and that investment in terms of meeting the the fuel poverty targets that are that are set out in the Energy Efficient Scotland program. So, so again, it, it just emphasises the the benefits of of energy efficiency. That it's quite a mature in Scotland. There's been a lot of investment in it to date, and we should build on that track track record and put those targets into statute in this bill. Can Can I just as a supplementary to that? Is there enough? Um, for the people, I guess, in the middle, people, and I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, in my constituency, drafty old croft houses, the val um, and we all hear about the ones that are going for huge amounts of money in picturesque places. Many of them have very little value. In fact, not a value that would allow you to invest and, and borrow against to really make the, the change in, in your house's um, insulation. Is there enough available for those people who are earning, maybe not on high incomes, um, who probably need to clad their houses totally to get them to be efficient. Is there enough there to help them in, the, in that kind of spectrum of assistance that's available? Well, that's one reason we've argued that the, we, the budget needs to be aligned with meeting the targets set out in Energy Efficient Scotland. And we think that work really hasn't been done to see if, if there is enough in, in the program, estimating what would come from the public sector and what would be levered in from the private sector, from, from householders, to see, you know, is that a realistic balance? How, what levers, what financial incentives, what loan schemes and such are being used to achieve that balance? And we don't believe that that modeling has, at least I haven't seen it published, perhaps it has been done. Um, to give us confidence and also to give the, the homeowner market confidence that they will be able to achieve this vision that, that they should be able to, as part of that just transition, to a low carbon, warm and affordable to heat home all over Scotland. I think you know, just, just transition is a really important concept and it's an important part of what a successful transition is. Um, and that means um, 
you know, making the most of the expertise that we have in the traditional energy sectors, including oil and gas and the several hundred thousand jobs that there are, you know, that expertise is a resource that needs to be made the most of in the energy transition. So all of the offshore expertise that we have that can and is being used in the alternative sectors, and that's got to be a really important part of how the energy transition is put in place in Scotland and in the UK. And I think the other aspect of it is, you know, just uh, a just transition is one that avoids a kind of dislocation of the energy system. So that's really important for consumers. And, uh, you know, you, you will, we're now approaching the winter again, so you'll, you'll remember last year when we had a situation where we had to import um, a lot of liquid gas uh, LNG during the winter months, particularly in the, in the latter stages of the winter. You know, that comes at a huge cost because you're paying... Um, you're paying uh, Japanese LNG prices uh, one pound a therm, one pound fifty a therm, whereas usually the price is around 50p. So you're paying three times the price if you end up with a dislocation of your um, uh, supplies as a result, you know, as a result of going uh, a, 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 an energy transition that isn't, um, you know, considered and uh, in line with um, what is what is credible and what is good for consumers. A question from Richard Lyle. Yeah, two things. Um, on the gas, I think we're not storing enough. There are two gasometers on the M8 just outside Glasgow that haven't been used for years. Uh, in regards to your comment regarding um, loft insulation, boiler scrappage scheme, all the different programmes, I've seen, I was a councillor for 30 years, I've seen more in the last 10 years of the government in my local area in North Lanarkshire. There's a tremendous amount of um, new uh, uh, heat-saving uh, one section of Mighton-type houses. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Mighton houses were built roughly in the 50s. Cement um, uh, sort of outside. They are being encapsulated in foam and then rough-casted over in, in uh, an area that I know in Motherwell, which is not in my constituency. So there are a tremendous amount of programmes that are going on. Sometimes it's the housing associations are not tapping into those. I have experience of that also. Thank you. Is there a question? No, I, I, just a comment. Just okay. Then a moment, Fabrice Levesque. Just on the, the just transition point, um, I guess it's worth saying that the offshore wind sector is working with the oil and gas sector, looking at both sectors' ambitions to, to 2030 and beyond, and, and that's really. For the offshore wind sector, it's about securing the skills, making sure we actually have the, the jobs and the expertise to deliver the increasing ambitions that sector has now that costs have reduced significantly. Um, and that's also working with the oil and gas sector to make sure that um, there are opportunities there. They have a, a fairly aging workforce, and that's one of the issues they're trying to, to deal with. And I think the two of us can work quite well together, and we're already starting to do that. So I think it's, it's starting to come together already. It's questions from Angus MacDonald. Yeah, just a couple of questions on the, the Scottish Government uh, consultation, which took place uh, the summer before last um, on, on the bill. Um, you'll have heard me ask the previous panel uh, uh, about the consultation, um, so I'd be keen to hear your views on whether uh, the results of the consultation adequately reflect uh, are, ad are adequately reflected in the bill. Uh, and secondly, uh, should a net zero target or other matters, including the delivery of the, 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 the target, um, and the establishment of a just transition commission, as we've just been discussing, have been properly consulted on in the consultation. Would anyone like to go first? Okay. No, no, no comments on this in particular. Well, uh, perhaps I mean just on the, the the just transition commission. I mean clearly that should have been consulted on. I would. Imagine you would you would say. Yeah, I think it, 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 it potentially helps to have a, a reporting body uh, that um, can can uh, can um, make a judgment on those kind of things. I mean, I think in terms of the in terms of the nature of the bill itself, I think the, our view is that the the processes set out in the bill are actually quite useful from the point of view that it allows an iterative discussion of the issues of setting a net zero target and. Uh, uh, look at uh, revising the targets with advice from as with advice from suitable parties. In, uh, in our, 
we didn't comment specifically on the uh, the overall target because of the focus of our organization. Um, but in terms of the Just Transition Commission, we, we have been in starting to have dialogue with them about this issue of fuel poverty, affordable energy, and so they're aware that that's on, on, the, on this, their agenda. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, John, just, you want just to kind of supplementary on that one in regard to the Scottish Government consultation. I mean, do you think the results of the consultation are adequately reflected in the bill? Properly reflected, or would you rather to see the bill take a different shape? As I said at, at the start, that we we thought that there should be more in terms of plans, and I would add policy programs that, that are supporting the the achievement of those targets and and we have argued specifically for these measures on on energy efficiency targets to underpin energy efficient scotland which we put in our consultation response and i'm aware others did as well um, so in that way I, do, I don't think it reflected um, those consultation responses views Fabrice Lebet. In terms of the this detail specifics, I can't answer, but I guess, as I said earlier, uh, our view was um, it was a missed opportunity to set a specific date. I think that was our, our key takeaway, having looked at the bill. Dr Casey? Uh, I, think, I think in our response, we, we just raised... Uh, well, I think it's commendable that Scotland's a go at, you know, setting these really ambitious targets, but I think our concerns were, you know, about going above and beyond what the rest of the UK and the rest of the world are doing, which comes back to kind of my earlier point on competitiveness. So, so I think that was where we were kind of sitting. In, in some ways, we were hoping we'd stay aligned with the UK, but, but again, I, I, you know, I think it's commendable that Scotland are, are, are setting these stretching targets. Okay, and talking of targets, we now move to questions from Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener. And could I just ask a quick supplementary, possibly of Will and Fabrice, just about um, decarbonisation of heat, because Will, you highlighted um, the, the need for import of, of fossil fuel for that, if I understood you rightly. And uh, I, I'd just like to have both your take on whether there is a choice in this matter, and it, it is in uh, the possibility that there could be a transition to other forms of, of heat. And I, and I fully respect the issue around um, fuel poverty, of course, and the importance of that, and possibly... Elizabeth. Yeah. But um, very briefly, please. No, very briefly. I mean, there's a lot going on in this area. Um, there, are, there, are, there are several projects run by the gas distribution companies, including Scottish Gas Networks, Cadent, Northern Gas Networks, looking at the feas feasibility of um, bringing hydro you know, taking, taking natural gas, which is methane, um, applying you know, known technologies, things you can buy off the shelf to some degree, um, to reform methane into hydrogen and capture the CO2, um, and then looking at the feasibility of doing that. So there was an, an, an initial study, for example, about converting the whole of Leeds to hydrogen heating, um, and that's, there's a report coming out on Friday by Northern Gas Networks of could you actually extend that to the whole of Northern England. There's similar initiatives with Pale Blue Dot that you m may well know about around Aber the Aberdeen area, and then the Cadent project is about converting um, six or seven industrial users to, to hydrogen in uh, Liverpool and Manchester area. So all of those are, you know, at the feasibility stage at the moment, they're going to be part of um, what the what those gas distribution networks are thinking about for future supply of gas, and you know, there obviously there's then a, um, a a CO2 capture and storage element to those. But all of these technologies, you know, they're they're to a certain extent existing things that are being done and can be done. And the the work is around how do you put those together and make hydrogen a part of you know, domestic heating and industrial use. What what's stopping us? There's a couple of, yeah, um, good question. The, the, it's not just financial. Um, you know, financial support is important for de demonstration stages of these technologies. Um, and the, uh, the kind of, you know, how do you develop a commercial framework that can reproduce, to some extent, the success we've had with offshore wind, for example. The other, the other aspect that, <clears throat> you know, is... is needs to be thought about is what's the legislative framework for all this. So if you want to roll something out at scale and have people invest in it, they have to have a, an idea of, you know, what are, the, what are the parameters in which we operate? So energy supply is 
you know, across the board, something that is pretty highly regulated. So if you're going into a new product as, an, as a source of energy, you, you, you already will, would be thinking about, you know, actually, how am I going to be regulated in this world? Uh, and that's something that is not very present in the moment in the discussion. So it's both, both what's the commercial framework and what's the regulatory framework. And that's, a, you know, that's something we're hoping to see from governments in response to things, these, these initiatives. Just, just, yeah. Well. yeah, thank you. Uh, I think so. The, the Scottish Government energy strategy sets out two extremely different scenarios for uh, the energy system, um, and that's either ele primarily electrification, so using electricity, and for heat, that would mean uh, heat pumps, either ground source or air source heat pumps in buildings. And um, the other scenario is, is hydrogen, uh, and that hydrogen primarily probably produced from uh, natural gas um, turned into hydrogen and the carbon sequestered. So th those are the two options. So under the electrification scenario, um, you would see much less fossil fuel use. So um, I don't think it would entirely rule it out, but that would be a very low fossil fuel scenario. And the primary energy supply would come from electricity. Um, in terms of kind of our, our view of, of which is the better one, Clearly, those are just two um, extreme examples. The answer will probably lie somewhere in the middle. Uh, we have some concerns regarding um, hydrogen in that there is an awful lot of um, additional work to be done, as we just heard, in terms of actually putting the various bits together, demonstrating the, f the full chain and rolling that out. It's a, quite a big infrastructure project. And our concern is that we don't want that to distract from um, building on the technologies that we have today. So, for example, with heat pumps, Arguably, there's still quite a lot more that could be done to help grow that market in the same way that we've done with uh, wind turbines. So we've provided them with confidence. We've said we're going to do this at volume, and that's allowed supply chains to grow and get cheaper. We haven't really done that with electric heat. Uh, we're only just beginning, and things are getting much better because obviously the grid has decarbonised. So five years ago, a heat pump was roughly the same emissions as a gas boiler. Today, thanks to the rapid decarbonisation of the electricity grid, a heat pump is something like um, 30, 25 to 30% um, of the emissions of a gas boiler. So it's now truly become low carbon heat. So we still need to do more to help that sector, to help roll out that technology, work out some of the issues. And the same goes for another near-term technology that we could be rolling out, and that's district heat networks. So, so they're essentially large pipes in the ground. We generate heat in power stations, we pipe it to, to buildings. Um, they could actually take uh, large-scale heat pumps, perhaps drawing on energy in rivers uh, or the air. And I think, again, that's a technology that is tried and trusted, proven, and we don't want the, uh, the focus on longer-term infrastructure like hydrogen to detract from those nearer-term technologies that we can do. Casey. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, decarbonisation of heat is also relevant to industry. And I think in some ways, uh, the one thing that hasn't been mentioned this morning yet is biomass. Um, we've done quite a lot of uh, fuel switching to biomass in the cement sector. Um, one of the things stopping us is that uh, government provides incentives for the biomass to go elsewhere, uh, whether it's to smaller domestic users through things like the renewable heat incentive or to larger power generators through things like renewables obligation. Um, we unfortunately fall right down the middle and we don't get any incentive. And, and the concern there is that we're just diverting biomass around rather than increasing its use um, and you know, reducing emissions overall. Um, just another thing on the hydrogen point, um, I think some of the barriers to its use at the moment is just, you know, as the others have said, more work's needed. Um, I think for the cement sector, because uh, whatever fuel you use can have an impact on the cement product quality, that's, that's one potential barrier. There's also kind of risks around hydrogen that have to be, safety risks that have to be really carefully assessed. Um, so, yeah, from an industry perspective, that's... Uh, Convener. Um, uh, Diana, you've already highlighted competitiveness and the challenges that that brings, and, and we're all aware of those, and uh, the issues around innovation and um, what we don't know that's going to be happening in the 2030s and 40s. Um, I would like to move us to the, the final um, target, as proposed in the bill at the moment, um, which is the 90% target, and then also to... Um, your, any comments, um, perhaps in, in the same remarks, uh, about um, the net zero emission target uh, for all greenhouse gases? 
So um, whether we should be seeing these things in the bill, what the options are, and uh, it's just a short comment, you know. <laughs> Anyone? So 90% um, is the, the um, target set in the bill. Um, the, I think, you know, just building on Fabrice's points, you know, we need to <clears throat> we need to think about and develop all of those technologies to succeed in that objective. So it will be a certain extent horses for courses. So in some cases, you know, just re remember we start from 80% of homes in the UK and probably a similar proportion in Scotland, you know, are used to having a gas boiler at the moment. So, you know, you've got to work with what you've got to some extent. Um, we need CCS to achieve any kind of target like 80, 90%. And if you read any of the international papers around there, they will, they will show that this is an absolutely necessary part of the, part of the mix to achieve those kind of um, greenhouse gas reductions. Um, as far as the net zero is concerned, I think we understand the, um, we understand the process that's set out in the bill. And we think that's quite a sensible process in the sense that you have a set of criteria you have a process to get advice from an independent party, and then you have a decision-making process that is democratic. And you know that's you know that that seems to me to be a framework that that is pretty sensible, um, rather than putting an, a number in uh, a bill for a date for net zero. Anyone else? Elizabeth Leighton. Um, yes, as, as I said before, we haven't comment, commented on the overall target, but we're firmly supportive of a, um, the target in the Energy Efficient Scotland program of a near zero carbon housing stock, or rather building stock by 2050. And in fact, we have said that that should be rolled forward, brought forward for the domestic stock because we are further ahead than the non-domestic stock. And so it would be reasonable to expect that action could be taken more quickly in the domestic stock. And, and just to remind, remind ourselves that with the IPCC special report, you know, emphasizing the need for urgent action over the next decade, while yes, we need to innovate and we need to look at you know, longer term solutions, at the same time, we cannot delay in doing what we can do now with the tried and tested technologies or very near, near term technologies. We know that energy efficiency, you know, just cost effective measures, you know, it can save, reduce our energy demand in the, this is a UK figure by 25%. And that's over the next 20 years, annual output of six nuclear power stations, you know, so, so there's a lot that can be done now. And, and hence the need to drive that action with, with the statutory targets and put more emphasis into things like, you know, making a jump from an F-rated property right through to a net zero carbon property. That can be done with, with schemes like the Energy Sprong scheme, a Dutch model that, that can do that um, on a sort of a street by street basis using off-site construction with little disruption and paying for it with the, sa the fuel savings. So the solutions are at hand. We just, we just really need to up the scale because just doing the, the area-based schemes, which have been a big success, uh, they're, they're just not going fast enough or they're not doing multiple measures. They're only dealing with insulation or the fuel poverty program, 4,000 homes a year. Really good program, but it must be multiplied many times. Stevenson had a quick question that you wanted me to bring um, in. For I specifically, uh, uh, to uh, Elizabeth Leighton, um, should we revisit the EPC definitions? Um, I just say that our house simply can't get to zero under EPC because we have uh, walls that are two feet thick and no place for cavity wall, but you get 10 points for having cavity wall installation. Actually, we're better insulated than we would be with cavity wall, but the EPC definitions prevent us getting to an A, A rating, even though we're doing better in practice. And there are similar difficulties in other parts of the way it works, because it doesn't actually measure the outputs and inputs of a house. It uses surrogates to estimate it, which are imperfect in particular cases. Yes, with the, we think the, the EPC itself, which uses an A to G scale, is, is a useful metric because people understand it. It is mm -hmm. simple. 
Um, they get it with appliances. It's been used with cars. But I agree that the, the methodology that underpins it does need to be updated and keep up with the new technologies or new knowledge about traditional buildings. Um, and there is a working group that the government is hosting that is looking at that. And so I would hope that they would be addressing some of those issues. Because obviously not every house can get to an A, but we should be striving to get as close to that as we, as we can. Fabrice Beck. I just wanted to come back to the, the question that Claudia uh, Beamish posed. In terms of kind of 90% and net zero, I guess to us it seems that the science is very clear that the, um, the ambition is net zero, and that is mid-century. Um, if you take the, the renewable sector, 30 years ago, uh, the European wind in industry was just building its first demonstration turbines. We were just demonstrating the, the concept of, of wind energy. 30 years later, uh, we're providing something like 25% of the UK's electricity. We could be doing 50 to 60% of that um, by 2030. So we've come leaps and bounds in 30 years. I guess there are sectors that this target would affect who haven't uh, yet really felt the pull of this policy change and what they need to do. So delaying action and messages to those sectors means that maybe another five to ten years elapses before they really start to work towards uh, what they need to do. I think that the pathways should be clearly defined in the bill for sectors. I think we need near-term measures in the bill because there are actions that need strengthening in terms of what we're doing today. I don't think we need to set out a technological pathway in the bill itself all the way to 2050. Um, that's a, lo a very long-term timescale, and, and the point of the target should be recognising some of the technical challenges, but we're setting the challenge and allowing industry to innovate to work out what it needs to do to, to deliver that. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're, we're, the message is getting across enough about the, the, the economic benefits or the, the, the I suppose the, the business incentives that are out there if we have investment in innovation there's some real wins here for, for industry you think that's coming across strongly enough I think it has in the renewables electricity sector clearly because we're now reaping the benefits of years of investment but it, it takes a long time I think in the transport and the heat sectors um, clearly not I think we're just starting the conversation there I think the technologies have had um, an ebb and flow of support over the last 10 years, particularly in the heat sector. So it's been difficult to make the same case that you could do with offshore wind by saying, give us 10 gigawatts of, of volume and we'll deliver a turbine facility in Hull, we'll deliver ports investment across the East Coast. For the heat sector, they've, they've not been able to do that because there's been uncertainty around whether there's political ambition to actually do this. So I think you're right, there hasn't been um, enough advertised in terms of what the potential benefits are, but I think there are large benefits. We just need the confidence to actually mm -hmm. go the after them. The lack of consistency in government policy yeah. has, has maybe everyone nervous about. Yes, Will. Yeah, I mean, and we're, we're actually you know, looking for that to come from uh, the government in response to the um, CCS uh, cost reduction task force report that really emphasised the kind of regional nature of the, cluster, the industrial clusters where um, CCS can, can be made to work. And that there's a you know there's a knock-on, you know, industrial policy benefit from developing those poles of activity, which are you know which are in 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 uh, you know in uh, coordinated with what we have already there into for the oil and gas sector and the renewable mm. sector. And there's there's really a chance to build on that in a in a further energy sector. And you know we're we're you know we're looking to the government to come back to respond to that report in a really positive way, both the Scottish so Government and the So we've UK got other government. countries that are doing things, but of course we have two, for two governments mm. in charge of pol uh, yeah. policy around this. Mm. So the, Indeed. You know, it's not enough just for the Scottish Government yeah. to, to set yeah. targets and be yeah. consistent in their approach. There has to be mm. messages going to UK Government. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. John Scott. Um, you spoke about hydrogen uh, earlier, and, but you haven't spoken about hydrogen in relation to the transport sector, and I appreciate it's not necessarily your sectors of choice to be experts on, but nonetheless, is the future electric for transport or is it hydrogen? Yeah, I think it's, a, uh, it's, it's, it's still in the, you know, it's, it's still, um, the jo jury's still out, I think. Um, it, it depends a little bit on the nature of the transport you're talking about. So. For personal and commercial vehicles, particularly ones which are returning to base quite a lot, even public transport, um, electricity is quite, you know, it, it seems to be fairly promising. Although at the same time, so, you know, I think we, 
we, we start from an, an assumption that you know, the, the, the electricity future for transport is you know, something very, already very real and can only get bigger. Um, we, we, we are seeing hydrogen used in terms of trains, buses in Aberdeen, um, and you know, there is the potential to use it in passenger vehicles as well. And you know, I, th I think we'd probably start from the idea that you, know, you, you don't necessarily get to a, to a point where one will dominate over the other, actually. So it'll, it'll depend a bit on the exact circumstances and even what consumers choose as well, because consumers don't always choose the best technology. Um, you know, it's, it's, what, it's what they find the most convenient or looks the nicest or what, whatever. You know, that's not quite the right way of putting it. But, you know, the, 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 there is a <clears throat> there is a sense in which you know we can't as a sort of all all in, all um, uh, all powerful entity say well you know every, everyone will choose this or that and and there are several technologies around there's several different types of journey that people can go on in transport or goods as well so you know it very much depends on those circumstances but hydrogen's probably got the most potential for you know large scale long distance transport HGVs shipping those kind of um, things, which at the moment use a lot of oil and gas and still will for a number of years as well. Richard Lyle, if you have a question. Yes, would, would we be able to produce enough hydrogen? And actually I saw, uh, I'll mention it, Shell uh, all over Twitter last week promoting hydrogen for, the, for, for cars. And in the last 50, 60, 100 years, we've changed and, and used so many different types of energy. Is that not the case? Yes, absolutely true. I mean, it, when before, when cities were still using town gas, that was 50 or 60 percent hydrogen uh, made from uh, the the process at the time. So, you know, it's it's uh, the, these these things are possible and they can be done, and the technology is out there, and it's you know something you know, that 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 governments should look really closely at and think about what what needs to be done in terms of commercial and regulatory framework. And now to questions from Mark Ruskell. Um, thank you. I'm just going to ask about the, the interim targets, um, particularly 2030. I mean, IPCC uh, refocused us on the importance of action within the next decade. Um, whether you think the 2030 target is sufficiently challenging? Fabrice Slavik. Just to clarify, is that the, the target that we have today or the one that's proposed in the bill? Uh, the one that's proposed in the bill. Uh, I think it's... I couldn't comment as to is it, is it sufficiently challenging in terms of the climate science. In terms of um, is it achievable? Uh, yes, I think um, the targets to 2030, it's, uh, it's really a, guess, a question of, of costs rather than technical feasibility. So yes, we could hit those targets. It's about whether we can actually, uh, at what cost we do it, and how those costs are distributed. Um, but I think absolutely, in terms of the energy system, in terms of electricity and heat, uh, we have the, the technologies there to do it. Uh, we need the political backing, and we need to have a program to get costs down properly. Mm -hmm. Okay, other views? Anyone else? If not, we could move on to other questions. Uh, just perhaps if I could just come back to the to the heat issue. Um, I mean, it seems odd. I'd, I'd heard that um, we're still in, installing oil-fired boilers as part of fuel poverty schemes in, in Scotland. I mean, have we really joined up enough policy on this? I and mean, that, that seems like very, very low-hanging fruit in terms of making progress on this agenda. Um, so are there, are there other kind of areas, particularly around heat, where we could be accelerating progress very much in, in the near term? You know, you pointed to the long-term picture. Are we going to are we going to be electrifying heat? Are we going to be using um, alternatives to, to natural gas? But w w what are the kind of actions that, that get us back on track for a higher 2030 target uh, in, the, in the next few years? So. Jason, I'll come to yeah, you sorry. afterwards. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so in the near term, yeah, absolutely. So the, the point you've made there around oil boilers being installed through fuel poverty schemes, um, arguably, if we're paying to replace people's heating systems, we should be fitting them with uh, something that's future-proof. So replacing that oil boiler with a heat pump or a biomass boiler, something suitable. And that's still going on, and that absolutely demonstrates that there's not quite the route across from the climate targets through all the different variants of Scottish Government policy. That's also the case if you look at the, the new build sector. The Scottish Government has devolved powers to set 
its own standards for new builds. And at present, uh, the majority of new buildings are built with fossil fuel heating systems, even oil systems as well. Um, there's currently a review going on, so that would be an ideal opportunity to make sure that we're, make, we're installing uh, low carbon heat systems in those buildings. It's the cheapest place to do it. It also allows uh, the supply chain to do more, and that's what we really need to get the costs down. We have a fragmented, relatively small heat supply chain with a larger market, say from new build. You'd be able to um, reduce your overheads, improve kind of installers' confidence and knowledge, and expand the kind of distribution supply chains and have um, be able to serve all of Scotland um, with the relevant skills. Right now, some areas pay a premium because people have to travel from from quite far. Skills. If have we got a skill shortage? in this area about doing the future-proofing type ins installation that you're talking about? Is that... I'd say not, not at all. Um, no? If, if you look at kind of the people who install uh, low-carbon heat systems in domestic homes, that supply chain has shrunk over the last three or four years in Scotland. Uh, the market has dipped, uh, partly because incentives have been, have been cut. That creates a kind of public perception that it's not really worth doing anymore. In rural areas, the oil price has dropped, and that before high oil prices drove a lot of people to look at alternatives. So it's probably a bit of slack in the supply chain. Um, if we were to really be ambitious and go a lot quicker, then absolutely we'd need to make sure that we have the right uh, skills and training in place. Um, we have got that in Scotland. Uh, it's not beyond us to have a, a planned approach to this and make sure that we set people up with the right um, skills that they need. Okay. Elizabeth Layton. Um, yes, I'd, I'd agree that there needs to be a, a bit more joining up because, you know, we're still connecting people to the, the gas grid as well. You know, we're extending the gas grid. And, and I think most, most people would assume, well, the best solution will be, oh, we'll just have a switch over to hydrogen at some point and, and then we don't have to worry about it. But again, you know, that is very distant if, if that is a solution. And there are lots of questions about that. It's a distant prospect. And so we, so we really must do all that we can now on, on low hanging, medium hanging fruit with with the energy efficiency scheme and low carbon heat we now have to join those together so area based schemes will can no longer be just about solid wall insulation it also has to be addressing the heat issue at the same time and yeah i i, I just think we should be a bit careful in thinking talking about things which are you know either long term or distant or very long term you know as fabrice says you know 30 years ago um where we've gone from in the wind sector to where we are now and having a tw 12 megawatt is it the biggest ones being built so you know a lot ever such a lot could be done in a 20 or 30 year period so you know and you know hydrogen technology is something that exists and it's out there it's not that experimental but so it is to some degree just a question of you know overcoming the kind of chicken and egg issues that there are with any big change from one system to another system um, and uh, just going back to the the fuel poverty point you know that the again it's a bit of a it, it it does come down to the individual circumstances of the case i think so you know not all homes are suitable for for, for heat pumps for example um and you know so it depends on the circumstances in, in which you know and whether you're connected or not connected to the to the system and uh you know so uh, it's not an area where I, I, we particularly have a lot of expertise but i, I think there's a there's a specificity around individual cases that has to be taken into account. Dr. Casey. Thanks. I think we've talked a lot about, um, you know, decarbonising the heat itself. Um, I think our concern is some of the Scottish government policies around the fabric of the building. Um, we've got evidence that heavyweight building materials can save a lot of carbon, and it, it's one of the things that, going on to the kind of reporting side, um, you know, we, we feel that when you take cement and concrete over a whole life, um, there's a lot of carbon savings that can be made. Concrete actually absorbs CO2 and permanently stores it over the course of its life, and that's something that's not measured or reported at the moment. So coming on to a net zero target, I think we need to make sure that we're including all the sinks possible, um, and we're coming up with a methodology to help kind of measure that so it can be included in reporting. Um, but... Uh, the uh, heavyweight materials like thermal mass uh, provide thermal mass, which keeps a, 
uh, building temperature stable. So, you know, occupants are less likely to turn up that thermostat. So whatever heating choice they've got, whether it's oil or uh, electric or whatever, they're, they're using less of it. So it comes back to the energy efficiency points that have been made. Um, and we've got concerns, particularly with the near-term targets, that if we're going to promote very strongly the use of timber in construction, we're going to lose out on those benefits. And in the long term, you could end up uh, worse off in terms of operational carbon of a building. Okay, right. We're going to move on to questions from John Scott. Yes, thank you for that. And you nicely led us into that question of what scenarios might require changes to the interim targets. You've just described one such, I think. Are there other scenarios that might require changes to the interim targets for 2030, say, and what are the imp practical implications of, of getting to these interim targets? Um, and if you've no answers, that's absolutely fine. And and can I also ask you, or subsequently ask you, should the ability to modify the targets in both directions be included on the face of the bill? That is to. It's a question we're asking all the panels. Yeah. Well, yes, I think. I think that's really all the answer we're looking for. <laughs> okay, well, Webster, yeah, I, I think the, the, the you know the bit, if the bill sets out a, a good process and a governance process for doing that, that's that's got to be something that's quite valuable in in policy making. Okay, we're going to move on to questions from Finlay Carson. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, section 5 sets out the uh, target setting criteria, including scientific knowledge, technology, energy policy and so on. Uh, are the, the target setting criteria fit for purpose and appropriate? Um, and should they perhaps align more closely with the climate change plan sectoral approach? I understand. Dr Casey. I think uh, we actually set uh, five criteria that we feel need to be included um, in our response. So that covered um, whether we've got the cost-effective technology uh, to meet the targets, um, economics generally, uh, comes back to my competitive thing that I've been going on about, um, policy, uh, fuel availability, so um, you know whether there's enough biomass actually to go around and decarbonise sectors that need biomass, um, and then it, uh, interaction with industrial strategy and and that kind of clean growth so so I think that that would be my you know our kind of top five criteria that we'd like to see included Elizabeth Leighton um, yes well I I don't think we, in our consultation response I, I I think we said that um, I'm sorry I didn't I, I should have noted this but that the criteria should be make sure that we're taking into account the social benefits or taking account of that because of course you know the we've talked a lot about economic benefits or economic impacts but there are very widespread social health well-being benefits that are associated with a low carbon transition and those are well documented in the case of of energy efficiency and housing and so we think that that is a a criterion that should be taken into account in target setting The Webster. Yeah, I, I'm generally I think the, the the targets seem to us to make a lot of sense and go back to some of the points we were making earlier about just transition, etc. So I won't repeat those. And I think it's good to have a kind of holistic set of criteria under which you know you, you, the policy makers can make a sensible judgment about all of the various aspects of adopting a target and what the implications of that are. And Fabrice Levick. I guess just. In terms of the technical criteria that might be attached, um, I'm not familiar with the target criteria, but I, I'm guessing that possibly there's a fairly strict kind of definition of technical, technical credibility and uh, the ability to kind of show a pathway. And, and I go back to my previous points that, um, for the, particularly for the long-term target, like 30 plus years, it's a to us, to our members, to our industry, it's a, it's a political signal. It's about telling us here is where we need to be. Uh, we're not expecting the government to shout, draw us a line and tell us exactly what the solutions will be. That, that's mostly for our industries to, to do. So I'd just like to clarify on, on the technical criteria eligibility. It strikes me that possibly it's been set fairly strictly, which is why we've kind of come to this uh, current proposal, which is uh, a process to set a date uh, in future, but not now. John Scott just has a supplementary question. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I just develop that theme? I know in the aviation sector that... Um, 
they're quite driven by the criteria and regulations that are set for them, and they seem to have the ability to develop uh, cleverer and clever engines and m more fuel efficient engines. And are you saying essentially the same thing across your sectors? That if they, I think you did rather hint at that, uh, Mr. Webster, that in the hydrogen sector you needed the regulation and criteria to be put in place now to drive, um, to allow people to, to develop the innovation that you think is, is definitely out there. Um, is, is that correct? Or discuss? Yeah, I, 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 I think it's not, it's not necessarily part of the technical criteria for choosing a, a, an emissions target, but having, having, a, having a, a, a suitably ambitious target that's achievable, backed up with you know, the appropriate legislation for innovative technologies to come in, and that can be in terms of the commercial investment framework and also the legislative framework in how you deal with your customers, that kind of thing. You know, all of those things need to be in place to give the to give investors a reasonable degree of certainty about what the what the nature of this investment is, particularly if it's something relatively new. And you think that yeah. would be helpful if that was part of the bill? Um, not well. I think not necessarily an, an integral part of the bill, but the process set out in the bill from going to the targets, to the climate change plan, into the policies, is is a sensible way of doing it. In fact, no, I probably. My, I, I, you know, I, th I think it makes more sense to have them as, you know, sequential in some degree, rather than trying to put everything into one great big bill that sort of try to tries to cover everything all at the same time. We're going to move on to questions from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, the bill uh, talks about the advice from the Climate Change Committee, and particularly in relation to zero and net zero target, as being achievable. What does achievable mean to each of you, or to those of you who wish to comment? Dr Casey. I'd say achievable is, uh, you know, decarbonisation without deindustrialisation. Anyone else? So, just to check. So, therefore, it's not linked at some magic insight as the technology is going to be available. It's simply a guiding set of principles that get you to the destination. Yeah, well, I think the technology's obviously got to be part of it as well. Um, but I guess my comment comes from ensuring we keep our foundation industries in, in, the, in Scotland. Um, and, um, you know, we, we know what technologies we need to get there. Um, and, and let's support our industries to, to get commercial deployment of those technologies to get decarbonisation without having to import the materials that they're currently producing in this country. Professor Beck. I guess achievable means there is a way, theoretically there is a way to produce the emissions to the level that um, we've set. And my understanding is that um, for those very last few bits of emissions, um, those uh, measures, the ways you do it, are, are still relatively speculative and would require a fair amount of innovation. But I think it's within the, the bounds of possibility, and therefore that, that's what's achievable. The question on, on costs is, is different, and I think that will be mediated by public appetite for doing this, by political appetite for doing this. I think there's no worry that the... Um, costs won't be uh, mulled over and factor into our decision-making. I think the, the danger is always actually that that's going to weigh down on what we do. So in terms of a, an ambition for emissions, achievable should be what is plausibly doable that we know that we have to do. And we'll let politics, we'll let the public fight over the speed in the, the, at which we do this. Because if we look back at the history of climate policy, we've, you know, the reason for um, the uncertainty, the reason that we haven't developed uh, uh, manufacturing for wind turbines, for example, in the UK is because we've had uh, back and forth of policy. You need clarity over, over decades to make those kind of investments. So I think there's no danger that the business commercial competitiveness worries will feature into the debate. I think for the purpose of a bill and the purpose of a long-term target, it has to be around what does the science tell us to do and what is it we're aiming, aiming to get to. Professor Jarrett. The, um, the scientific evidence about climate change is overwhelming to most people with a rational mind, I think. Um, and therefore, 
the need to set a target is, should be blindingly obvious. If we don't, it will be too late. So it's a case of how do you get there? Um, some people won't like it. Um, and some people won't um, like the impact it might have on our quality of life, in inverted commas, or in a phrase that's in the bill, sustainable economic growth. I mean, um, inf perpetual growth is um, defies the second law of thermodynamics, so um, we're going to have to re-look re at that one. It's sustainable economic development you might need rather than economic growth. As we move forward to this target that we have to set, um, it's a case of whether you do it as a technological optimist or as a technological s skeptic. Um, uh, and I mentioned before the risk of assuming technology will sort you out. But the, the, the one thing is sure, it doesn't matter whether you, if, if you start out as a technological optimist, there's no guarantee that that will work. And if you start out as a technological skeptic, the skeptic there's no guarantee that will work either. So you've got to think of what are the outcomes going to be if you adopt the technological optimism path, and it turns out to be the game's a bogey, you're rather up the creek. If you, if you take a slightly more cautious approach and say technology won't necessarily fix this, it's going to need some change in behaviour, then uh, if it turns out that technology could have helped you, you're better off. And th there's a very wonderful paper by, uh, written by a chap in the States called Costanza, and I'm happy to give the reference to the committee afterwards, and he explores this. And that there are four scenarios. The technological optimist, um, if it works, you end up with what he calls a Star Trek outcome. And if it doesn't work, you end up with a Mad Max outcome. And for the skeptic, you end up either with big government or ecotopia. And, and he gets people to look at uh, what decisions they might make and what regrets they might have. And it really is quite staggering. It'd be, uh, uh, members of the committee might, have, might like to have a look at it, and I'll happily provide a copy if that would be useful. I think we'll, we'll take that on. I've always had doubts about the second law of thermodynamics and the whole business of entropy. Since we originated in the discontinuity when neither time nor energy existed, so it can be created from nothing. But let's not go there. Um, I just wanted very quickly <laughs> to move to... Uh, uh, to uh, Collapse into nothing if we don't do something well, about indeed, it. Well, indeed, indeed. Sorry, let's really not go there. Um, but the, 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 the other remaining thing, I think, in what I want to ask that's worth asking is, is just whether the, the interim targets are uh, uh, good enough for motivating industries and good enough to get us to the kind of destinations I think we all, in broad sense, see that we, we, we have to get and in particular in the next 15 years, where some of the things that are going to deliver in the next 15 years, we probably already have to have started. Just this, please. We are running out of time. We've got a couple of members still ask questions. Fabrice Lebec. Yeah, I think the interim targets um, would increase ambition and self-interestedly as an industry, obviously, with ones that would deliver the most of that. So it's in our interests for that to happen. Um, and yes, it would help drive investment. Um, Right now, we're, we set a target and we're struggling to meet it. If you move that target, maybe some of the things that we're not even doing now that I've mentioned already, new builds, district heat networks, rural heat, those things are an absolute given under a higher scenario, so it definitely would help pull through more, more activity. Right, uh, move on to questions from Angus MacDonald. OK, thanks. Um, if we could briefly uh, turn to the use of carbon credits, um, just keen to hear your views on whether... You agree with the government's uh, approach on retaining an option to use carbon credits and in what circumstances these might be used, for example, achieving net zero. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Professor Jack. Um, I had difficulty actually understanding this part of the bill, I have to say. It's rather obscure, but I, to reflect some comments I made earlier, I get really worried when... We imagine that the um, future of the planet can be left to the market. And there's an element of this in offsetting and, and carbon credits. And I find it slightly dishonest in a way that we, we're prepared to sort of buy some, some, something from somebody else to allow us to carry on behaving badly. It, it's, to me, it seems like um, donating money to the charity for fallen women were up while still using the brothel. And um, 
it's not a road I prefer to go down. It, if we think carbon is important, then we should reduce the use of it. We shouldn't be trying to pretend that we're helping the world by buying a few credits from some poor other poor country to help them uh, improve their lot. We should do that anyway, actually. Our moral obligation is to help countries less fortunate than ourselves get to a situation where they're in a much better position. We shouldn't be doing it on the pretext of uh, helping them and while we meanwhile continue to pollute the planet. Um, would else? you mind if I moved on to the final question? Fine. Richard Lyle. Yes, um, as I asked the, the previous panel, is the panel content or not content with the new approach to annual reporting? Just for clarification, do you mean the percentage bit or the... No, they're, they're going to change. They're going to change the annual report, uh, basically the way that we're doing the annual... Reporting. Uh, Rationalised annual report produced by Section 33-34 2009 Bill so that it contains only information directly related to the outcome of the emissions reduction target for the relevant year. So they're changing the way it's being reported. Are you content or not content? I think I'm probably ambivalent, to be honest. I take that as a, as a defence set. Perhaps your second question is more relevant in terms of sectors. Yeah, uh, what are the, the advantages and disadvantages to annual sectoral reporting on the climate change plan? You got an so opinion let's on imagine that? that the oil and gas sector had to report as a sector. We, we have a lot of obligations around uh, reporting uh, and around the cost of... Um, uh, using using carbon in in, uh, in our processes, so we're already we already have a number of reporting obligations. I you know, could go into a list, but I won't. Um, but the, the I mean the really the really key thing that we are having actually to come to terms with is the implications of uh, phase four, the emission trading scheme. Um, so the that uh, piece of legislation, um, if it is uh, used in the UK, will you know, it significantly, you know, it increased the costs of um, emitting CO2 from our production um, processes and most of the other sectors that are covered. So we've already seen the uh, emission certificate price go from around five euros per tonne up to sort of, it's gone, to, it's gone up to 25 at a certain point and it's now at around 20. So this is going to be a significant cost for the sector. Um, uh, and you know, there will be quite a bit of activity involved in, in how, to, how to deal with this. Um, and uh, you know, as well as the reporting requirements, you know, these, are the, these are the things that you know, really will drive different behavior rather than, um, you know, rather than the oversight of different pieces of legislation. Dr. Casey. I'd say energy intensive industries are already reporting into so many different schemes. It's a massive burden. Please don't burden us with any more. <laughs> Maybe I should report that my son works in the oil and gas field in, in Aberdeen, so I maybe record that just to keep myself correct. Thank you. Elizabeth Leighton. Um, yes, I'm, I'm taking sectoral more from the point of view of the climate change plan and how that's been broken down. And, and I think definitely it would be um, advantageous <coughs> to have sectoral reporting so that we actually understand progress against the targets, presumably this would be um, supported by reports from the UK CCC. And then they would also show how it's aligned with the budget. Again, this issue of you need adequate resources if we're going to make these targets credible. And that there's some plan for corrective action if they're falling behind of what they said those policies would achieve. That's been a failing of you know, previous climate change plans, even though the detail is useful. And if I can just comment briefly on the achievable targets, I, I would hope that the committee will be you know, looking at what comes from the UK CCC, that you've asked for advice on that, and presumably that will give you some advice on, on those, in, both the interim and the, and the final target. But I would think that it's saying achievable is, would give you some comfort that the, the Parliament is a good place in providing leadership, um, not only in Scotland, the UK, but in other parts of the world of responding to that IPCC report with targets that are going to 
address the challenge that they've set us. Good note to end on. Um, thank you very much for all your evidence this morning. Um, it's next meeting on the 27th of November. The committee will continue its consideration of the Climate Change Emissions Reductions Target Scotland Bill when it will hear evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. The committee will now move into private session and I request that the public gallery be vacated as the public part of this meeting is now closed. Thank you.